week ago I found them and thought they would be pretty pertinent to the topic, but the science aspect of it, it was so complex, it took so long, and really this could be so complex and take so long also, um, but I'm not going to spend that much time on it. Um, but uh, Okay, so I'm just going to get started. I'll just do this one quick because it's uh, humorous. It has some good information, so I thought I'd include it. So we got humor in the spirituality near the end of the life. Because yeah, generally people think about these topics when they're about to die. So, you know, just this person put together a clinical uh, doctor, put together an issue about spirituality towards the end of the life. My father does hospice. The doctor deals with this quite often. You know, people are never prepared for death. But, you know, relatively... Religious people, other people are extremely prepared for death, as where other people aren't. So understand why spirituality and humor are bound to any processing of end-of-life issues. Begin to revisit exploring personal concepts of end-of-life issues. Appreciate faith-based contributions to end-of-life care. Illustrated by Japanese and Jewish percepts. You know, so a lot of semi-funny uh, jokes about dying. And even the hospital, you do see a lot of humor. Even though people are suffering, um, you do see a lot of humor. So why do we fear dying? We fear the unknown. But from the uncertainty leads to the hope of something more to come in afterlife. Processes of coping with dying, the fear of dying, denial, humor, faith, acceptance, and embrace. So humor and faith. Humor erases fear and anxiety. Humor makes angst manageable. Humor provides a communication interface. Uncertainty breeds hope for an afterlife. Faith diminishes anxiety. Faith, the promise of an afterlife, becomes an assurance of an afterlife. So some quotes about death. We're philosophers. When we're feeling good, we're frightened when we're feeling ill. Death is nature's way of telling you to slow down. Life is pleasant. Death is peaceful. It's the transition that's troublesome. I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it through not dying. It's not that I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. You know, Woody Allen. Okay, so... More serious, look at the Japanese, faith and morality of the Japanese, Japanese until the 5th century, Shinto belief systems. A lot of death you know, was problematic, early childbirth, so they had talismanic prayer, lucky gods, symbols for long life, immortality, gosho ningyo, a fat chubby child, figure given as gifts, happy, fat equals healthy. Adoption of Buddhism is promised the next life being better. Zen fatalism, acceptance of death is a blessing, a bridge, that's it. You got death poems, crossing the Rubicon. Although the consciousness of death is in most cultures very much part of life, this is perhaps nowhere more true than in Japan, where the approach of death has given rise to centuries-old traditions of writing Jishi, or the death poem. Such a poem is often written in the very last moments of the poet's life. Some examples. So the Jewish religion, monotheistic re Judaism. Your biblical area, death comes to all with little hinting at afterlife. The rabbinic area, punishment even of the pious, and the reason for discovering resurrection in the teachings. <coughs> you have the Sadducees, rigorous fundamentals, afterlifes, the souls die of the body. We come, we live, we go, that's it. As opposed to the Pharisees, tradition is molded by contributions from continuous succession of fathers. Souls have deathless vigor. Beneath the earth, there are rewards and punishment for the latter everlasting imprisonment. The former shall have the power to revive and live again, on account of which they are able to persuade greatly the body of the people. So some Pharisees said we are resurrected body and soul. And others said we are clothed at the resurrection. 
to the Essenes, Platonic belief that souls freed from the body rejoice and mount upwards. And you have Kabbalah, Hasidism. So humor raises death, fear, and anxiety. Humor makes death things manageable. Humor provides a communication interface. Uncertainty breeds hope of afterlife. Faith diminishes and conquers death, anxiety. Faith, the promise of an afterlife, becomes an assurance of an afterlife. Death is simply a shedding of the physical body like a butterfly shedding its cocoon. So humor and faith, both tangible aspects of the human spirit, are allies in the clinical management of those souls and their loved ones who are dealing with life-limiting illness, longing a part of the healer's tools that the modern sophisticated interventions, they've demonstrated potency and stand as a cornerstone of palliative care. Okay, so that one was kind of random, but I thought I'd include it. Look at that later. So let's keep this going. Okay, so let's look at overview Hinduism and Buddhism. Hinduism religion dates back to at least 1500 BC, according to uh, the Western scholars. 750 million Hindus in the world, most still live in India. Hindus believe in a single divinity or supreme god as is present in everything called Brahman. Hindus also believe in other gods who are aspects of that supreme god, such as the trinity Shiva, Brahma, Vishnu. And a Hindu believes in the individual soul called the Atman. So you get karma and reincarnation. Reincarnation is the belief that the soul repeatedly goes through a cycle of being born into a body, dying and being reborn again into a new body. Karma, a force that determines the quality of each life, depending on how well one behaved in a past life. According to Hinduism, we create karma by our actions on earth. So reincarnation, samsara, the wheel of rebirth, which means soul is reborn. One life form to another, continuous cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. People may be reincarnated at a higher or lower level of existence, depending on the karma from their present life. People may be reborn as plants or animals, or they may be elevated to a higher caste as humans. Death is not the final for Hindus as they expect to be reborn many times. Moksha. Each time the Hindu soul is reborn into a better life, it has the opportunity to improve itself further and get closer to the ultimate liberation. The liberation is called moksha. One attains moksha when one has overcome ignorance and no longer desires anything at all. The one who reaches the state no longer struggle for the cycle of life and death. The way to get moksha is not to create any karma. Three paths to achieve mo moksha, the path of duty, sanatana dharma, the path of knowledge, Jhana Yoga and the path of devotion, Bhakti Yoga, unconditional surrender to God. So Brahma, the creator, is the first member of the Hindu trinity and the creator periodically creates everything in the universe. The world periodically here refers to Hindu belief that time is cyclical. Everything in the universe except Brahma and certain Hindu scriptures is created, maintained for a certain amount of time and then destroyed in order to be renewed in an ideal form again. And Vishnu, the maintainer, preserver, Second member of the Hindu trinity maintains the order and harmony of the universe, which is periodically created by Brahma and periodically destroyed by Shiva to prepare for the next creation. Vishnu is worshipped in many forms in several avatars. Vishnu is an important, somewhat mysterious god, less visible than nature gods that preside over elements. Vishnu is the pervader, the divine essence that pervades the universe, usually worshipped in the form of an avatar. And Shiva, third member of the Hindu trinity, tasked with destroying the universe in order to prepare for renewal at the end of each cycle of time. Shiva's destructive power is regenerative, necessarily steps that make renewal possible. Hindus customarily invoke Shiva before the beginning of any religious or spiritual endeavor. They believe that any bad vibrations in the immediate vicinity of worship are eliminated by the mere utterance of the, his praise, the name Shiva. Dharma, ethical duty based on the divine order of reality, similar to the concept of religion or even halakha, you believe that a person has an obligation or duty. So Varna Shosa Clash, you have the Brahmins, Kisetriya, Vaisha, Sudras. Brahmins, the intellectuals, 
priestly class who perform religious rituals, etc. Nobles or warriors, the Vaisha, commoners or merchant, ordinary people who can produce, farm, trade, or earn a living, and the Sudra, the workers who traditionally serve the higher classes, including laborers, artists, musicians, and clerks. So you have the Vedas collection of Sanskrit hymns in the oral tradition going back much further than the Upanishads, which is the inner mystical teachings that were passed down from guru to student. Common holidays, you might see Diwali, Festival of Lights, October, November, series of five festivals. Ganges River, river falling from the source of Vishnu's feet onto Shiva's head and out from his hair, the water of the Ganges is sacred enough to purify all sin. Banaras, Hindu's holy city, over 1,500 temples devoted to Shiva. Jainism, ancient religion from India that teaches that the way to liberate liberation and bliss is to live a life of harmlessness and renunciation. The aim of Jain, life is to achieve liberation of the soul. The Buddhism, philosophy of Buddhism is based on the teachings of Lord Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, around 500 BC, royal prince of Kapovastu, India, age of 29, left the comforts of his home to seek answers to the cause of human sufferings. Gautama became the enlightened one, the Buddha, after wandering and meditating for six years. So Buddhism teaches its followers to perform good and wholesome actions and to purify and train the mind. Final goal is to achieve nirvana. Buddhism spent, your Buddha spent 45 years traveling through India, teaching the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Through the Buddha's effort, was able to gain a large following of several thousand disciples. After the Buddha's death, the followers continued to travel, preaching the new religion throughout Asia continent, China, Japan, Korea, and eventually throughout the world. Four noble truths of Buddhism, life is suffering, suffering is due to attachment, attachment can be overcome, there is a path to, accom to accomplishing this. In the Eightfold Path, right view is the true understanding of the four noble truths, right aspiration is the true desire to free oneself from attachment, ignorance, and hatefulness. Right speech involves abstaining from lying, gossiping, and hurtful talk. Right action involves abstaining from hurtful behavior such as killing and stealing. Right livelihood means making your living in such a way as to avoid dishonesty and hurting others, including animals. Right effort is a matter of exerting oneself in regards to the content of one's mind. Bad qualities should be abandoned and prevented from arising again. Good qualities should be enacted and nurtured. Right mindfulness is focusing of one's attention on one's body, feelings, thoughts, and consciousness in such a way as to overcome craving, hatred, and ignorance. Right concentration is meditating in such a way as to progressively realize a true understanding of imperfection and permanence in non-separateness. So here you have Hinduism and Buddhism, some similarities. A lot of Hindus will actually call Buddha the 20th av avatar that uh, that uh, Buddha was an avatar of, of Krishna or Brahma, however you look at it. Okay, so thought some of this was interesting. Let's look at the self in Indian philosophy. Who am I? What am I? A lot of you know pretty basic uh, reviews, starting with the very basics. So henotheism, many gods, but all are forms of one being Brahman. You get the Rig Veda, they've styled him Indra, the chief of the gods, Mitra, the friend, Varuna, the venerable, Agni Fire, also the celestial great wing, uh, Grutma. For although one poet speak of him diversely, they say Agni, Yama, death, and uh, Mat Matar Visvan, the lord of breath. All these gods exist, but his diverse appearance of one god, the divine architect, the impeller of all, the multiform. In Bhagavad Gita, even those who are devotees of other gods and worship them permeated with faith, it is only me, son of Kunti, that even they worship, not in the enjoyed fashion, for I of all acts of worship in both the recipient and the Lord. I see the gods in thy body, O God. So Naguna Brahman, God without attributes, neti neti, not this, not this. And Saguna Brahman is God with the tributes. So you have the neti neti, the no attributes could be ascribed to God, 
or the ascription of attributes to God. So the abstract attributes that people, you know, familiar with Hinduism, hear this very often, um, you know, said all the time, uh, sat Shinanda, being awareness blit, sat, like eternal truth, being chit, awareness, ananda, bliss, and the concrete creator, preserver, destroyer, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. So sat Shinanda, being awareness bliss. General six orthodox schools, darshanas, the Vedanta, Shamkya, Yoga, Purva Mamasa, Vaisheka, and Nayaya. I reviewed this earlier in a different slide. So who am I? What am I? Advaita Vedanta, Shamka, and Yoga answer that I'm a higher consciousness that I might then I might realize desire, will, and effort are extraneous to me. But not all Indian philosophers agree. You have to this theistic Vedanta, Naya, Miamsa, all defend what they consider our common sense conception of ourselves having bodies, having thoughts and desires, and generally being part of nature. So in the Vedanta, you have the Brahman, the absolute ground of all being, reality, as it is in itself, God. And then you have the Atman, the soul. In the Advaita, you have non dualism. The soul is Brahman. In the monism, everything is ultimately one. Everything is Brahman. Brahman is a child, an elephant, you and me. We are one with everything. Everything is holy. So idealism, the world is as it appears, is not real. Distinctions are illusory. The world is maya, play or illusion. You know, maya, important concept. And you have theism, dualism, where you say the soul and Brahman are not the same. Not everything is identical with everything else. Realism, some aspects of the world are independent of us. At least some distinctions are real. The higher self, the Upanishads affirm that each of us in some way, a soul, Atman, a spiritual self that has or is capable of awareness superior to our everyday consciousness. This is our higher self. is continuous with the best of our surface of waking consciousness. We have self-awareness or awareness of being aware. Reflecting on our own consciousness and nature brings us closer to the higher self. So our self-awareness is the gateway to Brahman, self-illuminating like light. It's transparent to itself, self-authenticating. Experience uh, could turn out to be an illusion. All objects of experience could turn out to be something other than what they seem to be. But self-consciousness is not like that. We might misidentify an object lit by a lamp, but we cannot misidentify its light. So we don't really have bodies. We don't really own property. We don't really have jobs, but we are conscious beings. Our awareness is that we are aware is not an illusion, similar to Descartes. Samkhya, analysis of nature, dualism, reality consists of two irredu irreducible elements, nature, prakti, and the conscious being purusha. So Samkhya proposes carefully understanding nature, organizing principles, subtle, pre subtle presentations of nature as thought and emotions, come to recognize that we are distinct from our body and mind. Samkhya uses mental occurrences as external to true person, consciousness, the awareness of thought and emotions as a separate substance, the real person. So according to Shamka, what we are is consciousness. Eternal events, thoughts, feelings, and so on all happen to me. I am essentially the inner person, the consciousness is to whom they happen. So I'm thus transcendent. I'm not merely a part of nature. I lie beyond it. So personality is a mask. We have various personas that the true person identifies with for a time. In doing that, the true person thereby alienates himself from its native state or self-absorption and bliss. We don't create these masks. Nature presents them to us. By understanding them, we could more easily discover ourselves than the transcendent beings we are because we are really transcendent in ourselves. We are not really shaped by nature. We are free. So the strands, the gunas of nature, you have sattva, rajas, and tumas, sattva, light, clarity, intelligent, rajas, passion, dynism, tumas, darkness, inertia, stupidity. Sometimes, uh, you know, it could be the, the, mode of, uh, the modes of nature, Sometimes, in, in, according to Hare Krishna, it will be goodness, uh, passion, and illusion. Conscious being, body and senses, sensation or emotional mind, the manas, ego sense, ahamtra, rational mind or intelligence, booty. And Kathy Upanishad, know that the soul is riding in a chariot, the body as the chariot. Know that the intellect as the chariot driver and the mind as the reins, the senses are the horses, the objects of the senses 
what they reign over, what they range over, the self combined with senses and mind, wise men call the enjoyer. So we know a lot of these things out of uh, Western philosophy are actually directly taken from the Vedic literature. So Plato and Hinduism, Plato period is no passenger. Plato's horses are desires and emotion, not the senses. Plato's picture is closer to the Hindu account of the strands, intelligent passion, inertia, than to the distinction between soul, intellect, mind, and senses. Mind, body, and soul, soul separate from the body, mind, and intellect. Separability of the soul, consequences, enlightenment. You can detach yourself from each manifestation of nature. Reincarnation, the soul may occupy a different body and mind. And the self is a hierarchy, the great self, intellect, mind, objects of senses, and senses. You have to master yourself, higher items must come must control lower items firmly, object of the senses, the senses be objective, see the world as it is, pay attention, the mind, object of the senses, be active focus, intellect, mind, reason, thoughts and emotions, the soul, intellect, Brahman's ultimate reality, foul path of renunciation. Yoga, self-discipline. Practicing yoga, discover the higher self, postures and breath control, remove physical distraction, Meditation removes mental distractions. Concentrate to achieve complete mental silence, thereby find or achieve a transcendent consciousness. So Naya Vishika argue for the endurance of the self against Buddhism and the conception of self as distinct from the body against the shark of a materialist. We can see the same thing through different sense modalities. Recognize something perceived previously. And Uddiyana's refinement properties exhibited by physical things are signs of things unconscious. Since the precise material composition of the body is all the time changing, it could not be that which remembers. An amputee remembers experiences mediated by the severed limb, and so the bodily part is not crucial to remembering. Causal link between effort and action on the one hand and previous experience on the other, which is established through invariable positive and negative correlation, requires postulation of previous experience whose body is clearly not the body. From the Buddhism, you know, who are we? We are awake. The four passing signs, old age, disease, death, quest for fulfillment, self-indulgement, path of desire, asceticism, path of renunciation. Again, the four noble truths, life is suffering, desire, craving, or clinging is the cause of suffering. Nirvana extinguishes craving and suffering. Path of nirvana is the eightfold noble path. Other core doctrines, there's no soul or self. Anatman, no soul. What we call the self is really just a bundle uh, shandhas, uh, sh shkandhas. Everything is impermanent. So no self, no self to fulfill. The idea, self, desire, suffering. Absent self, introspect. What do you see? Thoughts, feelings, perceptions. You don't find anything else. You don't find yourself. There is no self or soul. A person is just a bundle of thoughts. So self-knowledge, knowledge of others, no self, no essence within me to know. The best I can do is to understand patterns in bundles of thought. Buddha, uh, Buddha Gosa, 89 kinds of consciousness. Nothing unifies them, only streams of consciousness. Nothing unites past, present, and future. Living being lasts only as long as one thought. People, minds, objects are only ways of speaking. Well, pretty interesting, you know, good overview. I wanted to get through these. Okay, so we're on that. Let's do Purva uh, Mimamsa and Vedanta. So, Jaimini Sutras. Jaimini is said to be the author of the original Mimamsa Sutras dating back to 400 BC. Their main purpose was to inquire in the nature duty of Dharma. In addition to this, we find discussions about sounds, words, and meanings. Unlike Nyaya, the six methods of knowledge, direct perception, pradyaksha, inference, anumana, analogy, upanama, verbal testimony, sabda, hypothesis, arthapati, and knowledge by negation, abhava. First four we have seen in Nyaya. Hypothesis is the basis of scientific method. A hypothesis is made on the ground that something already observed would have been impossible without that hypothesis.
So hypothesis cannot be arbitrary, must be corroborated by experience. The relative certainty of the hypothesis is derived from the fact that observed phenomenon cannot be explained otherwise, at least for the time being, so we make only working hypothesis. <coughs> so the method of negation or abava by what is seen and what is not seen must be taken together. If something is not seen, that too indicates knowledge. The non-operation of the five means of cognition is what brings about the cognition that it does not exist. That is in case where sense perception and other means of cognition are not found to be operative towards bringing about the notion of the existence of a certain thing. We have the notion of non-existence of that thing, and that means by which this notion is brought about is called a bhava. The sruti and smriti. Sruti means revelation, and smriti means refers to uh, social custom. The form former is a universal law, where the latter is a man-made law or convention. Sruti is more authoritative than smriti. When there is a conflict between sruti and smriti, the smriti should be disregarded. Vivekananda explains this as follows: In plain words, we have to distinguish between essentials and non-essentials in everything. The essentials are eternal and non-essentials have value only for a certain time. And if after a time they are not replaced by something essential, they are positively dangerous. One should distinguish between social laws and universal laws and should not confuse the two. So the Vanta of uh, Bhadi Rayana, the Vedanta Sutras of Brahma Sutras were written down by uh, Bhadi Rayana, 500 BC, 200 BC, 555 sutras are often terse and over the centuries, many commentaries have been written on them, notably from Shankara and Ramanuja and Madhva. So the meaning of Vedanta can be split into two, Veda and Anta, literally meaning end of the Vedas, or end of knowledge. This word should be taken to mean the distilling of the philosophy of the Vedas in Upanishads into its essential components. Shankara builds upon Kutapada's commentary of the Madhukya Upanishad. So Shankara's non-dualism in his commentary, Shankara begins by asking if there's anything in our experience that we can be certain of, similar to Descartes and Russell. Shankara begins by saying, our sense may deceive us, our memory may be an illusion, the forms of the world may be pure fancy, the objects of knowledge may be open to doubt, but the doubter himself cannot be doubted. It cannot be proved because it is the basis of all proof. The self is self-established and is different from all else, physical and mental, and the subject is not the object. It is the undifferentiated consciousness which remains unaffected even when the body is reduced to ashes and the mind perishes. So Atman and Brahman, Shankar explains the eternal self is the Atman and the universal self is Brahman. The world is bound up by the categories of space, time, and cause. These are not self-contained or self-consistent. They point to something unalterable and absolute. Brahman is different from the space-time caused world. The empirical world cannot exist by itself. It is wholly dependent on Brahman. But Brahman depends on nothing. Ignorance affects our whole empirical being. It is another name for finitude. To remove ignorance is to realize the truth. While well, absolute truth is Brahman, empirical truth is not false. So the dream and the dreamer. The dream depends on the dreamer for its existence, but the dreamer does not depend on the dream. The dream is real as long as the dreamer is dreaming, but not so when the dreamer awakes from the dream, just as there is a difference in the level of awareness between the dream and awakening so also is the chasm between the waking state and the enlightened state. This is Shankara's famous Mayavada, or the doctrine of illusion. It is often misunderstood as a statement, the world is unreal. So Saguna in Nirguna Brahman, the highest representation of Brahman through logical categories is Ishvara, Saguna Brahman, or qualified Brahman described in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. Nirguna Brahman, Brahma five qualities, uh, transcends this and is the basis of the phenomenal world. Building on Gaudapada's Chakra writes, as one dreaming person is not affected by illusory visions of his dream because they do not accompany him in the waking state, so the one permanent witness of the three states is not touched by the mutually exclusive free states. For that, the highest self appears in those three states as a mere illusion, not more substantial than the snake for which the rope is mistaken in the twilight. The existence of the rope is not dependent on the appearance of the snake, but the appearance of the snake is dependent on the rope. So also the world is dependent on Brahman, but Brahma is not dependent upon the world. The example of thorn, if a thorn is stuck in one's foot, we take another thorn and carefully remove it and then discard both thorns. We don't keep one as a souvenir. Similarly, the doctrine of the individual self having itself in Brahman. Does 
away with the independent existence of the individual self, just as the idea of the rope does away with the idea of the snake. So all that exists is Brahman. With impeccable logic, Shankara asserts, all that exists is Brahman, the substance of all experience is Brahman. He arrives at this, Vivekananda explains, let us examine our perceptions. I see blackboard, how does that knowledge come? When the German philosopher calls the thing in itself of the blackboard is unknown, I can never know it. Let us call it X, the blackboard X, acts on my mind, and the mind reacts. The mind is like a lake. Throw a stone in the lake, and reaction wave comes towards the stone, which strikes the mind, and the mind throws a wave towards it, and the wave is what we call the blackboard. I see you. You, as reality, are unknown and unknowable. You are X, and you act on my mind, and the mind throws a wave that I call Mr. So-and-so. So more Vivekananda, there are two elements from in the perception, one coming from the outside and the other from the inside. And the combination of these two, the X plus mind is our external knowledge. All knowledge is by reaction. The real self within me is also unknown and unknowable. Let's call it Y. When I know myself, so is, so, is so-and-so. It is Y plus my mind. The Y strikes a blow into my mind. So our whole world is X plus mind externally and Y plus mind internally. X and Y stand for the thing in and itself behind the external and internal worlds. But X equals Y. X and Y are both unknown and unknowable. All difference is due to time, space, and causation. These are constituent elements of the mind. No mentality is possible without them. You can never think without time. You can never imagine without space. You can never have anything without causation, the forms of the mind. Take them away, and the mind itself does not exist. According to Vedanta, it is the mind, its forms, that have limited X and Y apparently and made them appear as external and internal worlds. But X and Y being both beyond the mind are without difference and hence one, we cannot attribute any quality to them because qualities are born of the mind. That which is quality less must be one. So X is without qualities. It only takes qualities of the mind. So does Y. Therefore these X and Y are one. It's the matrix of, matrix of associations. When we try to understand, when we say we know, we see that it is more or less classifications and arrangements the mind is a network of associations, and wherever we meet or perceive, we try to pigeonhole the perception. The process of pigeonholing is what gives rise to the feeling, I know. Knowledge arises from arranging facts, from the relationship between ideas. What we mean by proof is a sequence of logical implications, beginning with axioms that have been assumed without question. Explanation only means this. We relate it to what has been known before or what has been deduced before. We associate it with perfect impress with past impressions. When it comes to existential questions, the mind is so baffled by the very questions it cannot answer them. In a sense, above these questions are unanswerable. So Vivekananda explains, if knowledge means finding associations, then it must be that to know anything we have to see the whole series of similarities. Suppose you take a pebble to find the association, you have to see the whole series of pebbles similar to it. But with our perception of the universe as a whole, we cannot do that because of the pigeonhole of our mind there's only one single record of the perception. We have no other perception of the same nature or class. We cannot compare it with any other. We cannot refer to its associations. This bit of the universe cut off by our consciousness is a starting new thing because we have not been able to find its associations. It is only when we find its associations that the universe will stand explained. Until we can do that, all the knocking of our heads against a wall will never explain the future because knowledge is the finding of similarities and this conscious plane only gives us single perception of it. So the role of reason does not mean that we don't we, we abandon reason. We must take reason as far as it can go. When that is done, Vedanta says reason is transcended, but until then we must rely on reason. Chakras Advaita is deep and profound. Its insistence on rational thought and reason degenerated over the centuries into linguistic wrangling. Thus in the 11th century, Ramanuja devised a form of qualified Advaita known as Vishita Advaita. So Ramanuja's objection to Shankarya, there is no proof of a non-differentiated substance. According to Ramanuja, differentiation is the only thing perceived. Consciousness and Brahman are not identical. Rather, consciousness is a tribute of Brahma. Since the mind cannot only understand symbols and images, there is no point discussing the abstract that is beyond mind. Therefore, Ramanuja gave his qualified view of the Brahman of the Upanishads. So Brahman, Atman, and Jagat. For Ramanuja, Brahman, Atman, and Jagat are different and eternal. At the same time, they're inseparable. Inseparability is not identity. Brahman is related to the other two as a soul, as the body, the three together form an organic whole. So Ramakrishna explains in a conversation with Vivekananda, Ramakrishna explains as follows. 
According to this theory, Brahma or the absolute is qualified by the universe and its living beings. These three, Brahma and the world and living beings together constitute one. Take the instance of a pumpkin. A man wanted to know the weight of it. You cannot get the weight by weighing only the flesh. You must weigh the flesh, the shell, and the seeds together. At first it appears the important thing is the flesh, not its seeds or shells. By reasoning, you find that the shells, seeds, and flesh all belong to the pumpkin. Likewise, in spiritual discriminations, one must first fo reason following the method of not this, not this. Brahman is not the universe. It is not the living things. Then one realizes, as with the pumpkin, that reality from which we derive the notion of Brahman is the very reality that evolves the idea of living beings and the universe. The absolute and manifestation are two aspects of one and the same reality. Brahman is qualified by the universe and living beings. This is the theory of qualified non-dualism. So Madhva's Dvaitva and dualism, 13th century Madhva builds upon Ramanuja's system with one major change. He rejects the interdependence of the three ideas, Brahman, Atman, and Jagat. They are simply independent and eternal. Thus, it is quite natural that a dualistic philosophy of God and the world emerges from such a view, emphasizes the emotional component of physos, psychophysical being, and advocates bhakti or devotion to raise one's awareness. And uh, Madhva, the Hare Krishna, Lord Chaitanya, I think it's based on Madhva. So Vivekananda com comments on bhakti. The one great advantage of bhakti is that it is the easiest and most natural way to reach the divine end in view. Its great disadvantage is that in its lower forms, it degenerates into hideous fanaticisms. All the weak and undeveloped minds in every religion or country have only one way of loving their own ideal. That is by hating every other ideal. The same man who is kind, good, honest, and loving to people of his own opinion will not hesitate to do the vilest deeds when they are directed against persons beyond the pale of his own religious brotherhood. However, the danger, Vivekananda says, is in the early stages when bhakti has become ripe and it has passed into the form called supreme or para bhakti. No more is there any fear from those hideous manifestations of fanaticism. Thus, if one is aware of this danger, one could use bhakti to raise one's level of awareness. In Knowledge by Deni, Denity Arabindo writes, in reality, all experience is in its secret knowledge, secret nature knowledge by identity, but its true character is hidden from us because we have separated ourselves from the rest of the world by exclusion, by the distinction of ourselves as subject and everything else as object, and we are compelled to develop processes and organs by which we may again enter into communion with all things that we have excluded. We have to replace direct knowledge with conscious identity by an indirect knowledge, which appears to be caused by physical contact and mental sympathy. The limitations is a fundamental creation of the ego. So underlying view of Vedanta, no single viewer system can encompass the cosmos and manifold experiences of the human psyche. It must be admitted that the mind is an evolution. Vedanta begins with the premise that there is something deeper than what is perceived either by the senses of the mind. But the way to discover this is through the mind. The book we must learn to read is our own mind. The scientist uses the reasoning faculty combined with intuition. So also the seeker after knowledge must combine both. Vedanta is not a system, but rather a psychic journey. It is a journey of the mind, just as science is not a finished system, but is evolving. So also Vedanta represents the spiritual knowledge in evolution. Okay, so that was a pretty good one. And uh, so let's keep it going. Here we got Southern Asians religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Shintoism, and philosophy of Confucianism. Buddhism, about 6% of the world's population today, fourth largest religion in the world, though most of its followers are in Southern and Eastern Asia. So you have a distribution map of Buddhists around the world. You have more review of Buddha. Sarnath, famous location of Buddha's first sermon. Repeat the basic beliefs. We've seen this before. Nirvana, the ultimate goal of Buddhist. State of enlightenment where one can have happiness and peace. In order to achieve Nirvana, a person must follow the middle way, eightfold path rules of conduct. The middle way, so these are the eightfold path. Recognize the truth, avoid evil actions and bad people. Do not say things that hurt other, respect other people and their belongings. 
Choose a job that does not harm others. Don't think evil thoughts. Avoid excitement or anger. Work at meditation. Think carefully about what matters in life. Beautiful temples. So the Buddhist holy book is called the Tripitaka. Contains all of Buddha's teachings. Buddhas do not worship a god, but rather Buddha by thanking him for his teachings and reading the Tripitaka to become more enlightened. Hinduism, largest practice religion in, in India. 80% of Indians are Hindu. Third largest religion in the world. It's huge temples. You know, we've seen the basic beliefs. You know, some animals like the cow are especially sacred, and many Hindus are vegetarians, obviously. Hindus believe that all living beings have souls. Reincarnation, moksha, caste system, belief that social class is hereditary and does not change throughout a person's life. The only way to change caste is to be born to a different one in the next life. Seen this before, Brahmins, Ksetriyas, Vaishya, Sudras, untouchables. We got Shintoism. Shinto is the earliest religion in Japan. Unique to Japan is not spread to other parts of the world. Shinto means way of the gods, once the state religion of Japan, and is still widely honored among the Japanese. Shintoism has no rules for moral living and no concepts of a single ruling god, no single text that is followed. It centers on the reverence of the kami, divine spirits that live in nature. Many Japanese believe that the mountains and rivers in Japan are home to these kami and are considered very sacred, like Mount Fuji. Shintoists believe in the prayer. They offer prayers and rituals, perform rituals to honor and please the kami. Most Japanese households have a small altar where the family will offer prayers for the spirits they hope will bless and protect them. Many worship their ancestors who believe they believe became kami when they died. Shintoism stresses the value of cleanliness and teaches physical purity. Since Shinto offers no ideas of moral code, a god, or life after death, many people who practice Shinto also practice another religion as well. You have the famous Tory Gates, mark the separation between the human world and the world of Kami. Shrines. So Confucianism. Confucianism is not a religion, but rather a philosophy that is often said to be the foundation of modern Chinese culture. Confucianism was declared the official guiding practice of the Chinese government and still has great influence in China today. Many people in China still support the teaching of Confucius and emphasis on dealing with others fairly. Confucianism is also practiced in other parts of East Asia. It's a map where you see. Uh... So Confucius was born in 550 BC, a time when the government was having trouble keeping order and warlords controlled. Much of the land believed he knew how to bring peace to ancient China. The key was for people to behave with good character and virtue. Confucius created a moral structure for social life and politics that every person should follow. Confucius was not a religious prophet or leader. He saw himself as a teacher. Basic beliefs, Confucianism thought a philosophy of ethical system based on good deeds and morality rather than religion. Confucius believed there were five basic relationships among men, ruler and subject, father and son, husband and wife, older brother and younger brother, friend and friend, and believed that each relationship was based on kindness. There would be peace and harmony in the country, golden rule of behavior, what you do not like when done unto yourself, do not do unto others. So the sacred texts, four books and five classics, the authoritative books on Confucianism written before 300 BC, illustrate the core value and belief systems of Confucianism. Okay, so there's a nice quick overview. And... Uh, so, let's look at ancient Egypt. So just trying to cover some of these different systems that I'm going to try to amalgamate, and really these are not very in-depth. So, you know, the Egyptian civilization, Old Kingdom going back to 2700 B.C., the soul, 
So the Nile River floods. One of the first civilizations in the world around the Nile River and the farming based on the flooding there. The whole of Sortis, pantheons of gods. Religion contributing to stability, uh, stability, your atom. Egyptians were deeply religious people. Religious roots were in the worship of nature deities. Their first gods were animal forms. Those responsible for creation were the most important gods. Atum, the creator god. They later developed national gods around the Middle Kingdom. Amun, local god of Thebes, god of the dead. Osiris, Anubis, Horus, and Thoth. Religion was instrumental to the stability of Egypt. Life, social structure, education, laws, rule of pharaoh, economy, death, and afterlife. So you see the geography, you know, the population near the certain areas of water. So you have fertile soil in certain areas, access to the Mediterranean, increased and expanded trade culture. Culture is one of stability, not rapid change. Deserts were an important source of minerals and building supplies. So some highlights from Egyptian history, unification of Egypt, probably about 3000 BC under King Menes. And then you have the building of the pyramids, the Imenhotep, uh, not a ruler, but revealed revered in his life is recorded. Architect medicine, right hand to Pharaoh Djoser, national god Amun-Re, and the Exodus, the famous, the Hebrew Exodus, the Israelites at the end of the 13th century. BCE. Some more timeline. Alexander the Persians defeat Egypt in 525 BC. And then Alexander the Great takes over, then Cleopatra. And then Egypt becomes part of the Roman Empire after the death of Cleopatra. So pharaohs were absolute rulers of the land, believed to be earthly embodiment of the god Horus, who was the son of Amun Re. Therefore, they had the divine right to rule allowed them to move between God and their people. People followed their orders because they believed they were from God. No one would challenge the king's authority, and he could rule in relative peace. Throne passed on to the eldest son of the principal queen, who was usually the eldest daughter of the previous king, therefore the king's sister. Pharaoh owned all the land. They had a hierarchy of government officials to help him rule. Second to the pharaohs were the scribes who would record the doings of the pharaoh. In legal traditions, you had the goddess Ma'at, representing truth, righteousness, and justice, balance and order. Laws were applied equally to all classes, specifically protected the family, children, and wives. Punishments could be quite severe. You social roles for women. Had quite a bit of rights, supposedly, considered to other uh, civilizations. Same legal rights as men for land, property, and divorce. So agriculture was the main source of Egypt's wealth, abundance of management of food supplies, created a powerful economy that made Egypt the biggest power in the world at that time. Education also contributed to stability and continuity of Egypt. All children, regardless of social class, received some education, followed a moral and ethical guide, instructions, and wisdom. Goal for education was ensure youth exhibited self-control and good manners. At 14, young boys followed fathers and jobs and girls learned from mothers in the household. Children of peace were, priests were schooled for more formally. Literacy was stressed for government jobs, education respected for creating well-rounded individual. Hieroglyphics, encourage people to learn more about them, very interesting. And then the New Kingdom, the famous Rosetta Stone. Life and death, measure in accordance with Mat, the goddess and symbol of equilibrium of the universe. And the king had to rule according to her principle. Death views as new beginning. Afterlife come to all regardless of social status. Two common principles, body preservation and lifelike form. And the deceased must have items necessary for life in the afterward. Personal belongings were usually placed in the tomb to make the call more at home and to assist the dead in their journey into the afterlife. Text was read from the Book of the Dead, which is a collection of spells, charms, passwords, Numbers and magical formulas for the use of the deceased in the afterlife. 
So Ka is the soul spiritual duplicate, Ba's personality, and Ankh is the form mummy took in the afterlife. We have these weighing of the heart judgment scale. <coughs> Mummification, encourage people to learn more about that. On the Nile River architecture, very interesting. I'm more concerned in the spiritual you know, aspects related to the soul and consciousness. The pyramids, how they built. Just look through a few, they got nice pictures. Government and religion were inseparable in ancient Egypt. Pharaoh was the head of state and divine representative of the gods on earth. Religion and government brought order to society through construction of temples, creation of laws, taxation, organization of labor, trade with neighbors, defense of countries' interests. Ancient Egypt esteemed stability through the cooperation of all levels of the population. Pharaoh was on top. Next to him, the most powerful officers were the visors executive heads of the bureaucracy, under them the high priest, followed by the royal overseers, administrators who ensured that the 42 district governors at the bottom carried out the power's order. You know, scribes, artisans, farmers, and laborers. <coughs> so probably the origins of Freemasonry likely to have originated in Egypt. <coughs> the writing system, interesting, I encourage people to learn more about it. <coughs> Religion, the glue that blinds local communities together and transforms them into nation, creates common understanding, shared values that are essential to the growth of a civilization. Support the concept of God existed, magical power was encapsulated in the hieroglyph of a scepter or rod. By looking at ancient Egypt, one could see how belief system evolved in the early stages human thought the concept of God did not exist. Our early ancestors were concerned about natural phenomena and the powers that controlled these phenomena. They did not worship a personalized form of God. As human society evolved, people gradually gained a degree of personal identity. With a higher sense of individuality, humans began to conceive the gods in a personalized form. Stage in development is called mythical. In Egypt, this process began during the late prehistoric period when writing was uh, be beginning. So you have Os or Osiris, Isis, and Horus. You know, the early stage, every Egyptian town had its own particular de deity represented by an animal. Eventually, these gods and goddesses were given human bodies and credited with human attributes and activities. The temple in the major cities throughout the land were constructed to venerate local gods. So like all religions, that of ancient Egypt was complex. It evolved over centuries from one that emphasized local deities into a national religion with a smaller number of principal deities. Some theologians think that Egypt was moving towards a monotheistic faith in a single creator symbolized by the sun god. There's no single belief systems, but there were commonalities. So priests work at the conduct, uh, temple, conducting the daily rituals of clothing, feeding, and putting to bed the sculpted images that represent the gods. In mortuary temples, priests conducted similar ceremonies to nourish the caste, soul spirit of the deceased pharaoh. Priests shaved their heads. The body, ancient Egyptians believed the resurrection of the body and life everlasting, they believe, was rooted in what they observed each day. The sun fell into the western horizon each evening and was reborn the next morning in the east. New life sprouted from grains, planted and earth, and the moon waxed and waned. As long as order was maintained, everything was highly dependable and life after death could be achieved under certain conditions. So Herodotus documents mummification. 450 BC. Three elements of the Egyptian concept of soul. Ka is the life force or spiritual double of the person. Ba is represented as the human headed bird that leaves the body when a person dies. The face of Ba was the exact likeness of that of the deceased person. And Ak is the spirit of Ray representing light the transfigured spirit of the person that becomes one with light after death. So the journey of the afterworld was considered full of danger, traveling on a solar bark.
The mummy passed through the underworld, which was inhabited by serpents armed with long knives, fire-spitting dragons, and reptiles with five ravenous heads. Upon arriving in the realm of the land of the gods, the deceased had to pass through seven gates, reciting accurately the magic spells at each stop. If successful, they arrived at the hall of Osiris, the place of judgment. Here the gods of the dead performed the weighing of the heart ceremony to judge whether the person's earthly deeds were virtuous. The person's heart was placed on a scale counterbalanced by a feather that represented Mat, the goddess of truth and force, truth and justice. If the heart was equal in weight to the feather, the person was justified and achieved immortality. If not, it was devoured by the gamut uh, amendment. This meant that the person would not survive in the afterlife. When Pharaoh passed the test, he became one with the god Osiris. And then traveled through the underworld on a solar bark, accompanied by the gods to reach paradise and attain everlasting life. So more stuff about Egyptian culture, daily life, beer, wine, hunting, fishing, houses back then. All very interesting. Encourage people to look into... Uh, its skilled artisans were considered socially superior to common laborers. They learned their art from a master who ensured style and continuity with the beautiful objects they created for the living and the dead. Skilled carpenters manufactured a wide range of products, from roofing beams to furniture and statues. Their tools included saws, axes, chisels, adzes, wooden mallets, stone polishes, and bowl drills. Other artisans include stonemakers, sculptors, bead makers, bricklayers, and potters. As said, most experts think that Freemasonry came from Egypt. The dress, wigs, sciences, the mathematics, possibly a concept of decimals and ten base, astronomy, medicine. So pretty interesting. You know, just wanted to cover that. I talked about hermeticism in a previous one. I'm not sure if you're there, Babs, if you want to join on. I'll put the link in the chat. It's pretty interesting. I wanted to cover this and... Uh, I got two more. So this one's also like an ancient history type. Uh, your early river valley, civil, river valley civilizations. You know, this is like a high school level thing, but you're just a nice overview. Culture, unique way of life of a group. Science called anthropologists study culture. Anthropologists examine the artifacts at already archaeological digs. From these, they create... We create a picture of early people's cultural behavior. Other science called paleontologists study fossils, evidence of early life preserved in rocks. Human fossils often consist of small fragments. You know, so in prehistoric times, bands of humans that lived knew one another, began to develop shared ways of doing things, common ways of dressing, similar hunting practice, favorite animals to eat. These shared traits were the first beginnings of what anthropologists and historians called knit culture. Culture included common practices by society, its shared understandings, and its societal organization by overcoming individual differences. Culture helps people to unify the group. People are not known, nor born knowing about culture. They must learn it. First, they observe and imitate behavior of people in society, and then people in society directly teach the culture to them, usually through spoken and written language. See so the hominoids. The Paleolithic, uh, Paleolithic age is what, according to common uh, anthropology, encourage people to uh, look into this if it's interesting to them. It's pre pretty interesting. Out of Africa theory, Neolithic age to about 3000 BC, also known as the New Stone Age. Humans shifted from a nomadic lifestyle to systematic agriculture, and the first permanent villages were established. People learned to polish stone tools, make pottery, grow crops, and raise animals. Early modern humans quickly distinguished themselves from their ancestors, who had spent most of the time just surviving. 
so this is pretty interesting. You know, this is pretty basic information. This is like high school level nomad hunter gatherers in Neolithic Revolution, agriculture revolution about 8,000 BC. Humans may have scattered seeds near regular campsites and returned the next season to discover new crops growing. Slash and burn farming, domestication, animal husbandry. Then you have civilization, complex culture in which large numbers of human beings share a number of common elements. All civilizations have the fi following five characteristics. Advanced cities, cities were the birthplace of the first civilization. The city is more than a large group of people living together. The size of the population alone does not distinguish a village from a city. One of the key differences is the city is a center of trade for a larger area. Ancient city dwellers depended on trade. Farmers, merchants, and traders brought goods to the market in the cities. The city dwellers themselves produced goods for exchange. You have specialized workers and artisans, complex institutions, record keeping, and advanced technology. For example, like irrigation. You have specialization of artisans. Institutions, one of them being religion. Your long-lasting pattern organizations, communities such as government, religion, and economy. So the growth of city religion became a formal institution. Most cities had great temples where dozens of priests took care, took charge of religious duties. Sumerians believe that every city belonged to a god who governed the city's activities. The temple was the hub of both government and religious affairs served as the city's economic center. You know, scribes, early cuneiform, possibly the earliest form of writing known through archaeology. You know, bronze age, and then start a barter. I want to mainly focus on the religion, not a world history class, but this is all interesting. I encourage people to study world history. You know, the famous ziggurats of uh, Babylon, Babylon pyramid-shaped monuments built in many Sumerian cities, including Ur, literally meaning mountain of God. At the top of the ziggurat, priests conducted rituals to worship the city god, often sacrificing animals and other goods. Ziggurats demonstrate the Sumerian belief in an afterlife. Ur's tallest and most important building was its temple. Like a city within a city, the temple was surrounded by a heavy wall. Within the temple gate, a massive tiered structure towered over the city. This was the ziggurat, and on its exterior, a flight of perhaps 100 mud brick stairs led to the top. So Mesopotamia, Fertile Crescent, city-states, governmental system, which large cities gain political and economic control over the surrounding countryside. Problem-solving activities require Sumer, require organization, cooperation, leadership, takes many people working together, you know, constructing large irrigation. Sumerians by 3000 BC had built many cities surrounded by fields of barley and wheat. These cities shared the same culture, developed their own governments, each with their own rulers, each city in the surrounding land. So pretty interesting. Then you had the idea of dynasty, family rulers, whose right to rule is passed on within the family. After 2500 BC, many Sumerian cities came under the rule of dynasty. So as we're going to see from the anthropological perspective that uh, – you hear Babs? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm just listening. Uh, yes, hello, I'm just listening uh, you, about your, anthro your like, anthropology lesson, talking about the Ba and the Ka. You're doing like perennialism, Masonic stuff, I, like symbolism. Uh, like parallels between religions and stuff. I'm enjoying what you're doing. Yeah, I just I did that one on Egypt. Now this is just kind of like a. I, mean, I just took the slides from an AP World History class. I'm adding some of my own stuff. Like according to anthropology, um, religion comes later to explain customs. So you have these, you know, th these things that seem to pop up just through use or you know, for however they they work in society grow and come up with certain ways in the creation of dynasties and systems and then the religions seem to come afterwards to explain um you know as, as somewhat descriptive not prescriptive that the religions were descriptive of what people were already doing and not prescriptive 
Yeah, it's, an, it's like an after the fact justification is usually how people look at it when they're looking at it from the anthropological sense. And there are some like incongruities there that do, that do need to be looked into. But overall, I can see why that I, I can see why people make analyses like that. Like, for instance, they'll say, oh, this food was considered this food is con basically like they would say um, the, the academic analysis is like, let's say that there was a law that said X, Y and Z foods shall not be eaten. The academic person would say, oh, well, it's because these foods were found to be poisonous. And then later, after the fact, uh, a religion, a religious sort of myth arise or, or was derived or was was sort of semi fabricated over the course of generations as to why uh, this thing ought not to be eaten. And it was given as some decree by like, you know, yeah, that's how by, yeah, or something academic like that, yeah. anthropology operates and all over the world, including Israel. And, you know, so here we're looking at the rise of polytheism pretty common practice where basically um, each town had their own little like gods of their town and then you have a larger structure and you have certain deities that are common among the um, yeah patron the deities it's like it's like how uh, a lot of Greek uh, you were talking about city states each having their own deities I know a lot of Greek and Greek city states also had their own their own Greek, particular deity Indiana. that they would worship like Athens had Athena if I'm not mistaken it's and so on and so forth and even the biblical commentaries um, you will say that that was the unification of the Jewish tribes under Jehovah that uh, different Jewish tribes worship different gods and we were united under Jehovah according to that same theory so you know, Babylon, uh, city-state, southern Mesopotamia, came here, says 1792, the leadership of Hammurabi, possibly the largest empire at the time. You know, Hammurabi has his famous uh, code, law code. Um, a lot of you know, biblical critics will point out the similarities between the code of Hammurabi and the Bible. Code lists 282 specific laws dealing with everything that... Uh, affected the community, including family relations, business conduct, and crime. I've read, I've read through it different times and seen comparisons of the Code of Hammurabi and the Bible. So the Nile River Valley, Delta, Namers, Minis. So here we're back in Egypt, the rise of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a theocracy, possibly the first theocracy. Theocracy, government by divine authority. Samaritans believe that the gods ruled their cities and that the rulers themselves were given power by the gods. The rule of the king was one striking difference between Egypt and Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, kings were considered to be representatives of the gods. To the Egyptians, kings were gods. The Egyptian god kings called pharaohs were thought to be almost as splendid. So I encourage people to read more about this, but I want just an overview for. You know, when we get into like the perennials and type concept of all the different uh, methods of understanding the soul. Yeah, no, I think that this is important to look at. And it's also important to contrast, I guess, what's called the, the academic ver view versus the Masonic or perennialist or, or arguably like t in some interpretations, like a hermeticist or view where it's like, one analysis is, oh, well, the reason why all these myths are similar is probably because they copy one another or because they speak to like psychological archetypes in the human mind. That's like the Jungian analysis or whatever. But then uh, like someone might also say, like a perennialist or a Freemason would say, well, this is just, you know, the human soul expressing itself each differently according to each civilization, but it's basically the same innate instincts of what is good and what is evil expressing themselves as we were created. You're even looking to like the brain as the prediction machine and uh, basically... You know, using we have very little reality, really little knowledge of what actual reality is like, and so we have competing models of what the world is actually like, and then we use that as a prediction mechanism to make further predictions. So you can see different religious systems and having their benefit or scientific methods. You know, for example, here we got the Aryan invasion theory, in uh, which is highly disputed. Almost no one in India believes in the Aryan invasion. And you know, some history of China. Oracle bones used in ancient Chinese priests to communicate with the gods. The priests scratch questions on the bones, such as, will the kings be victorious in battle? And they say dice originate 
from oracle bones like the expression rolling the bones literally comes from the oracle bones because dice used to be made of bones so chinese believe supernatural forces from which the rulers could obtain help in worldly affairs remains of human sacrifice found in the royal tombs are evidence of human eff efforts to win the favor of the gods or the chinese believed in life after death Mandate of heaven, belief that heaven, law of nature, kept order in the universe through the Chinese emperor and the disobedience to the emperor would cause chaos. Dynastic cycle. Then feudalism, political and social system established in China during the Shang Dynasty involved three distinct social classes, <laughs> family, landed aristocrats and peasants. Indo-European, the steppe. The Caucasus region, you see the Great Migrations, a little map of uh, postulations of people moving into Europe, at least in greater civilization, see the Hittites and Anatolia. Aryans and the Vedas said almost no one in Egypt accepts this Western understanding of the history of India. The Brahmins, caste system. Bharta, reincarnation, karma, Jainism, discuss this, Buddha, Nirvana, Noyans, the AGNC. Okay, mildly interesting. You know, just trying to complete these studies. Do you have anything you want to talk about? Um, yes. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, do I have anything in particular to talk about? Uh, nothing really. I just think that I think that this is a worthwhile topic. I think that this is something worth looking more into. Uh, yeah, I think that you should talk a bit more about like uh, the Sophia Ferenas talk more about um, like I don't know maybe do some like Rene Ganon or Shuan or do go into go into like some of the ideal ideas of Freemasonry a bit more than you were here. I think that this is interesting stuff worth looking into, and you could even on your own do some of the perennialist stuff by yourself just point out some parallels that you see jumping out at you right now between like different expressions of the divine across civilizations anything that catches your attention yeah i'm finishing up i'm saying like i've read a lot of I've, I've my, my father me and my dad have almost all the great courses and uh you know like i've read many books on this and many courses on these like overviews of the history of the world and uh yeah, I mean, well, the big one is like people like to say, uh, people like to say, well, you know, Jesus is this perennial archetype, and that gets Christians very upset because they like the idea that Jesus was the one and only. And then um, again, well, Freemasonry. Like, I, was, I was looking for some stuff on Freemasonry, some powerpoints. I really couldn't find any good powerpoints, um, but uh, books are better. Generally, powerpoints are, are not great. I generally just like to download PDF books and. Uh, I don't really have an audience that's like asking me to teach them these subjects. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more doing this yeah, as a you know, self study, like public study sessions. And uh, I just included this because all the talk about consciousness and really like I'm a soul believer. And uh, I wanted to include these theories of the soul from different traditions to, uh, you know, put into context with consciousness. And, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to go forward with my. I'm not sure where I'm going to end with this. Like, I, and like I, and, you know, and the, you know, what caused me to do this, I guess, was the debate with JF, and then uh, you know, just seeing that I didn't have on the tip of my tongue what I wanted to say, even though I've been studying this most of my life, I made a lot of mistakes, and then, uh, you know, so I, I decided to. I hadn't studied this recently, so I wanted to get up to date with uh, the state of brain research and consciousness research. And so from there, I spent basically the last two weeks, um, you know, many hours a day reviewing these studies. And I don't even know if I'm going to, you know, go on JF or talk with him again. I don't even know what we debate or if I'm going to continue, like, debating evolution. So this was more my own personal interest. Like, I just wanted to know this stuff, organize my thoughts. I don't even know, like, I don't plan on doing anything necessarily with this. I'm not, like, writing a book. I'm not... Uh, you know, pushing my videos or anything. I didn't even, these last few videos, I, I stopped even posting them on Twitter or Facebook. So, you know, I'm really largely just doing it as a method to review 
increase my memory and understanding. Yeah, I think that it's it's just generally I think it's a good and it's a fruitful exercise to like I have I'm also I'm pretty interested in specifically these topics, the ones you're covering in this video. Um, although the overall concept of consciousness and materialism and the soul and the mind is is also something that's interested me. Uh, yeah, I have a bunch of I have a bunch of videos up on perennialism. So if there's any if anyone wants to see more content on that, if you're if you want to see that, they can see uh, look up the, uh, the plebeian podcast on YouTube is the name of the channel as well as, uh, to a degree, a podcast called The Patrician Podcast. And, um, yeah, I spent a lot of time talking in there about perennialism with some people like uh, Adam Wallace and uh, uh, Mark Citadel. Um, uh, I think his reverend uh, something, Parry, and, so, and some others. It's pr pretty interesting content. I think George House is the name of another academic they have on. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, per, I think it's an interesting topic, and I think the reason why it's worthwhile to do the stream, this particular stream that you're doing right now today, is uh, because it's very important to compare and contrast the historical wisdom of all of everyone's ancestors for thousands of years, uh, you know, basically since we, since we uh, know about the existence of humanity, compare and contrast that with the views that today are informed by things like... Uh, Empiric empiricism, uh, what is perceived to be the current scientific method uh, to, to the extent of its limitations, etc. You know, the academic thought process. You were talking earlier about the way in which historians and anthropologists sort of sort of view the origin of myths and, and, and stuff like that, whereas, you know, the mythic origin of myths and the ancestral wisdom origin is generally different. So I just think, again, it's important to compare and contrast both, both from both, both in the sense of you know, my bias, which is probably trying to poke holes in the materialism, poke holes in the modernity versus also, I think that this would be interesting for a materialist kind of science, scientific minded person to look into because it gives an alternate interpretation. The perennialist lens, the free Masonic lens gives an alternate interpretation to the one of, oh, well, these religions are just similar because in innate human archetypes due to our evolution and our psyche, or these sales are just similar just because oh, the cultures were next to each other, so they influenced each other via trade. So yeah, you're, I think this is a good service you're doing, and I appreciate the stream. Uh, I'm going to grab some water. Yeah, yeah, I definitely enjoy... I mean, basically, like, I like the truth. I study for largely its own sake, your wisdom for its own sake. I don't have anything I'm directly intending to do with this stuff. Um, you know, you're so like a virtual-based medrash, like, you know, Kavrusa, Partners and Torah type thing. But I, I was hoping to be able to create, like, YouTube community around issues because, uh, yeah, I'm curious. I like this stuff. Like, my dad so now, he's... You know, my dad's almost, uh, you know, he's almost 70. And, uh, I mean, not quite, but, but uh, you know, he's been reading books on these subjects his whole life. He's got a huge library, like thousands, maybe over 10,000 books, and he's always buying books on, I mean, he mostly reads fiction, but he's always buying books on all types of subjects, always the new, he loves evolution and, you know, science and consciousness, science fiction, physics, uh, mathematics. He's always buying, like, new books on mathematical logic, and I was thinking, like, these videos I'm doing. I remember when I was young, I used to pick up my father's books on, like, mathematical logic. And the first chapter is always really, really easy. You know, just like laying the rules and the symbols. And then like by like chapter two or three, like it's all symbols and it's almost impossible to read. Um, but you know, just looking at my father, who basically he never did anything with all this information. You know, I mean, he worked as a doctor, in the, but he never really talked about any of this stuff, but he's always reading about it, thinking about it. And, you know, so I'm looking, that's what I'm doing too. I became like my father in that way. And I almost never talk to anyone about this stuff. Occasionally, like, I'll find uh, the, the Hare Krishna temple or some event. Like, you know, randomly, I'll just have some conversation with someone who also finds these topics interesting. And I was hoping, and, and I think, like, the the officials, like, official people researching it within the academic method are largely corrupted and hard to talk with. So I was hoping to be able to create some sort of you know, community, like a virtual base medrash. And it's like, okay, like me and you, like, okay, like, you know, like, should we just start learning with the Rambam or something like Maimonides and saying like, okay, Babs, like, you know, twice a week, we're going to meet up for an hour, do a Google chat and uh, until we, you know, get through the Rambam, 
you know, you know, start a book or something like, you know, Guide to the Perplexed, and we're just going to study an hour a week until we finish it or something like that, and uh, which is pretty common. Um, you know, I don't know if it's possible to create like a virtual base medrash for non-Judaic ideas where, you know, it'd be like me and JF or something who have strong disagreements about evolution, genetics, uh, race, um, multiculturalism, politics. Could we still put our minds together to like, you'll study together and try to advance scholarship in topics that are common interest to us. And uh, I don't know if that's possible. I think it's because, you know, insofar as he is an academic, specifically a very, I guess, scientistic one, for lack of a better term, he, uh, he just, he, the manner in which he perceives reality, the reality he, he lives in and inhabits is altogether alien to the reality you you conceive of and experience you see what i'm saying so it does it does cause a bit of tension there and i noticed already, this when you were yeah. when you were talking to him about consciousness and this is like livelihood so saying i'm not the, to me this is just something that interests me and uh i'm not trying to make money or make a living off of i'm just trying to get to the truth and uh i messaged from like the concept is like of uh can you create community on youtube like that and i don't know if you can I'm thinking like you know, as I'm escaping like the Lucas sphere or something, I don't really know anybody. I'm not am I really like friends? Okay, like me and you are friendly. We've talked offline a few times. Um, you know, maybe if like you came to Detroit or I came to New York, we'd meet up and hang out or something. Um, but like but but relatively and even if in the Lucas sphere, you're the only one that I, I, I really uh even exchange names with offline in uh you know, so I'm trying to see. I don't know if YouTube has any value in this. You know, so if it's just for me, like I could have recorded myself um, and not put it online, just did what I was doing and watched it back without putting it online. I don't know if there's an advantage to putting it online. You know, like being on JF, I saw that, you know, got a lot of views, ten over 10,000 views on his channel. You know, I got like an extra 100 subscribers on my page, probably directly related to being on JF. Some people came on, joined the chats. I had those, you know, lively post debates, ask the rabbi type thing. But like, I don't know if I gained anything from that. I don't know if I made any uh, friends. You know, I might see Tom Anderson. You're here pretty regularly. I appreciate you watching. You're usually, you know, pretty on topic and the point. Um, you know, the, you, the link's in the chat if you want to come on and say something. But yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I mean, it's about the way that I view it is, is mostly about it's about helping other people understand things from a different perspective or learn things that they don't already know. And then for you or me or whoever is the person engaging in these on, or sorry, sorry. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I just realized my mic was off. Um, did you catch any of that? Uh, yeah, I'm catching it just a little choppy. Yeah, okay. So okay, maybe it automatically switches to your computer mic. Yeah, I think it might be. I was just saying, uh, I, to me, the goal is... Um, I guess when when I engage in like a hangout, when I do live streaming, something like that is so is it's basically just sort of like I like to conversation is generally like the best conversation brainstorming something like that is how I think and I'm thinking that there are probably other people who think in a similar way. So if something that you know you say on one of those hangouts makes someone think differently or perceive or, or learn a new fact, likewise if you think differently from it or learn a new fact, you know that's. Uh, I think that's something to be gained, although that's a very. Uh, but I also think that uh, I also think that um, what do you call it? Uh, it's just to me, it's just like uh, the the interactions I have here. It's like it feels like I'm in I'm in a, a like a, a more interesting version of a college class, and it's like the discussion phase of the class, except it just goes on for a really long time, and you know you and. But it's not whoever, related. Whoever. It's like someone. It's like some someone, a fellow student, like sitting next to me in class, like maybe an adult student who like has a lot to bring to the table, or like a research assistant. Sorry, go ahead. Was well, it when it's in college? And I was thinking, um, you know, I, I'm looking back when I, you know, I was older in U of M. I was already in my early 30s, finishing up my degree at U of M, in a year master's degree in civil engineering, and they, they made us uh, you know, like group assignments, and, and they made us like take pictures because. You know, maybe they thought people wouldn't actually meet, and uh, and I, I saw the use of technology for these group assignments and like PowerPoints and making video presentations and Skype and all all this stuff. You know, Google Google Hangouts. Then I saw and uh, Google Documents and stuff like that. 
and uh, and then I got started at the downtown synagogue in Detroit. If you look at my first videos, um, we, I was trying to help make Minion there, and we started trying to make a Friday night Minion. And at that time, no one there really knew any of the prayers. So this one professor from University of Michigan came, and uh, you know, we sung the prayers. And, and it was technically before Sabbath, before sundown. And I put them up on my YouTube page to help people learn the Hebrew chants, basically. My first YouTube videos when I started my page, it was just a simple Friday night prayer service at the downtown synagogue. And then I took the words and I put them in the description, in the transliteration and translation. And the goal was to teach people how to say the Friday night prayers. And uh, they actually were like pretty popular relatively. Like a lot of those videos have like a few thousand views in over, th over a year. And I did them just for the, members of the congregation i put them on youtube so i figure you know people from the synagogue would be able to look at them and then there was like documenting community events recording things at the synagogue and uh and then like the Hare krishna i, I was in university i joined the the bhakti yoga the Hare krishna movement in the university i was kind of like documenting to like see whether chanting Hare krishna actually worked or not you know saying like so i was going to document it we were like going on the street and doing Hare Nam and chanting Hare Krishna, and uh, so I was documenting that, putting it on my YouTube page, and actually, uh, you know, like, I started noticing that people from all over the world were watching these videos, you, you know, like, I, uh, even before I was on Luke Ford, I had 100,000 views on my YouTube page, mostly of, like, chanting, Hebrew chanting or Hindu chanting or uh, community events in the Jewish community, and I noticed that people from all over the world would be watching these videos, especially, like, these basic like chanting videos like how to say kaddish how to chant some common hebrew prayers and uh, although i never really you know spoke to the people who were watching them and uh, then i started doing the luke luke ford stream and he got you know big you know, relatively all of those videos got over a thousand views and you know like a hundred hundred live viewers on average and i started putting up you know like because usually i'm pretty introverted i don't i, very, I rarely publicly speak um you know, but I'm always studying and researching. So like Luke Ford was one of the first times where I was like publicly just commenting, giving my opinions on issues, which is something relatively I rarely do. And uh, even the debate with JF, I don't think I've been in, I was on the debate team in high school. I don't think I've been in a debate my whole life before that. So, uh, I mean, so, you know, like, but uh, there was a topic I was passionate about and it's something, you know, so I did it. And uh, you know, so I see YouTube, Possibly like, okay, maybe I could make a living, make a market, try to gain an audience and make my own show and get money on it. Or if it's just, uh, am I, you know, trying to do something, put something out there for the benefit of people I don't know, which is try, you know, somewhat what I did or, or just using it as a venue for my own research, you know, and, uh, you know, and maybe to create intellectual community. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do that. You know, even if me and you were to like try to study Judaism or Jewish history and like or like me and Brundlefly where we were talking over these demographic things. And I thought that was relatively good programming and interesting. Like I don't know how interesting this consciousness stuff is. It is not really meant to be interesting. It's just a public study session. Um, no, it's good. It's useful. I don't think that questioning like this is necessarily good. I mean, maybe there are more productive things you could do, more productive ways of going about this. But the fact of the matter is like over the course of the four or so years that I've been doing YouTube, writing online, blogging, just expressing my viewpoints, trying to talk to basically to fellow Jews, fellow people of Hebrew descent, I've gotten dozens and dozens, probably about, I, I'd say like 60 to 70 overall people who actually like reached out with me and actually like engaged me in really in-depth discussion, you know, back and forwards, like email correspondences, mail correspondences, etc. I think that I think that I've, I have been, you know, I have tremendously benefited from this, sort of intellectually speaking, and in terms of just my knowledge of reality. And I hope to have uh, helped other people in some ways, just sort of like flush out their their own worldviews and conceptions of reality. Is just through just through just the random stuff that I've talked about for the past four years. So I think that uh, likewise, um, in just a public intellectual forum is useful. In uh, you know probably yeah, like your parents, especially for people who uh, don't get to express these things so much. Let's say in their in like their daily life whether it's the academic sphere or wherever they work or their social milieu etc well if you look at it, like your parents would they even be interested am i assume like your dad has a big library like mine and he's always you know reading both my parents spend the 
you know, majority of their spare time reading and they always have books that they're always getting new books. And I don't know if they would even be interested in something like this or even expressing like they just like reading, like acquiring information, but they really want to partake in like intellectual forum. And I'm not sure I would like to, And but it's tough to, you know, how do you develop community around ideas? And then you have certain issues like, you know, multiculturalism, diversity, politics, race realism. And, uh, you know, it's like, okay, like we're not friends. Why are we talking? We have such fundamental disagreements. You know, it's like, well, I want to go on JF. I'm, what am I going to debate him about another issue? Um, or, you know, like, you know, like Luke Ford or something like what, what there's not you know, like the, the politics of division is so strong that it's hard to say that there's a, possibility for intellectual community. You don't see what I'm saying? Uh, no, I do see what you're saying. I mean, say I if mean, you had a yeah. course, like like when when I was in university, if like you're, you guys made a Google chat study session in university, like you had your Blackboard or whatever your, um, you know, course web page information technology system that's connecting all the people to the same class and you had like a you know so then we usually had a chat we didn't have like a live chat but they could probably add it in even like a live chat where you know sometimes they used to say who was online when i was in university even like you know they'd say who's online in the class and if you could have added that to like a live chat like you want to do a live chat and uh and then you know kind of like the yahoo chat rooms way back you're even the original chat rooms on the internet when it first started, or you know even bulletin boards that might have been topic oriented, but now YouTube is very powerful because you record these videos, you have research, and people could look at the conversations later. And I don't know if there's intellectual community be, to be built around this. And even like, you know, it's like Judaism. Like, okay, if there are just two Jews or multiple Jews that want to, you know, we study Torah, but then you when you have non-Jews, then you have the JQ. And you have to you know, respond, and, and and maybe there is some common ground, you know, to have a non-dualistic Judaism where you could kind of openly, publicly study Torah, and uh, answer these questions, or that people would answer questions to the people, you know, to the basic questions that people are joining, and uh, but I don't see it yet. I don't see, I haven't seen any ability to create intellectual community on this. I mean, uh, you know, basically, no one from JF looked or critically one or two people critically commented on my response to JF on uh, multiculturalism where I went over all the different uh, overview of scientific evidence so there were a few comments on my YouTube page but a lot of them like they, they weren't really in good faith and a lot of them were just kind of like attacking me or somewhat you know basically like Jew hating or something but there were there were a few you know like legitimate like let's look into is diversity multiculturalism good or bad Let's examine the evidence. Let's talk about it. Let's have some sort of discourse on that. So even though you know the video got over ten thousand views on JF, there was like nine hundred people watching. Um, you know, only a few, only only a few, only like ten people you know watched my live video when I went over the evidence. You know, got a hundred views or so, and a few people left comments, and most of those weren't very intellectual. So. I was kind of disappointed in that and saying like, you know, made me like kind of want to not give up, but just saying like, yeah, it's this whole thing just a waste of time. There's nothing uh, really beneficial from it. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe you're just in the wrong, in the wrong area of the internet for it. Like it's just a question of finding the right people. Also, I think that the most, the you most know, like Brundle Fly wants me to get, you know, speak with Jay Dyer and I actually ordered Jay Dyer's book. Yeah, that's uh -huh. way, see, that's what I'm saying. Like, it would be way more productive for you to speak with Jay Dyer or Adam Wallace or Mark Citadel. Personally, I think than for you to speak with like a materialist, atheist, scientist, academic. You know, it's interesting because like it's the Rambam on Torah. You're not supposed to get paid for teaching Torah, and so it's similar. When you do something out of interest, it's different than when you do it to make money. So most of the people on the web who have audiences or popular, big followings. That's their living. They, they find, you know, might be they're passionate what they enjoy doing, but they found a way to make a living at it, and it changes the dynamic, where they're not really necessarily looking for truth anymore. Yeah, I totally agree. It's discourse. entertainment, it and it's please. It's entertainment, and it's pleasing the audience. You even Luke Ford, you know, his show, even to him, he's got to make financial decisions 
based on something and he's like okay like you know so you know, if i separate and say like i don't want to make money off like i mean you could i think i could make money off of youtube conceivably but i don't think it's that good of a way to make money it's not my greatest skill in that sense and uh dude you can probably make more money at like mcdonald's than you can in youtube yeah, well, I did, like, I think, like getting I making I a get, career off of YouTube is nigh impossible. Well, I used to get paid to do research when I was in New York. People paid me to do research for them, and I don't know if you know to make a YouTube like that where, and I like I, I think I did bring in a lot of super chats to JF when I was on, like uh, probably even more than most of his other guests. But I don't know if that'd be long term, and I don't know if I don't know if people would pay me to do research or write papers. And I don't even know if that's what I want to do. That like you know someone's gonna pay me to like you know write a write some sort of paper research project. Oh, you from... can get work to write. Oh, you can definitely get work to write. Like I write papers quite often, dude. You can literally sometimes get hundreds of dollars per paper to write a paper. You just need to be writing the right papers, be in the right place at the right time. There are even uh, like all sorts of stuff. You can even you can even get uh, get paid to like check over people's paper papers and correct correct their grammatical and spelling errors. But uh, yeah, as opposed as far as being paid to do research goes, unless it's really uh, specialized research, generally they get unpaid interns to do that stuff. But yeah, yeah thank I mean, God, I'm, not, I'm not really so worried about that. And I think they're thank God. I think I have easier ways to make money. You know, if I desired money, I think I have skills that would be much easier to make money than any any of the any of these methods. Although I enjoy doing this, and I think it's a certain enjoyment. Like you know, like I played competitive chess, and I, you know, like when you just enjoy it you get much better than when you're forced to or even when you're paid to and you know so this i just i just enjoy thinking about these things these topics interest me and i enjoy discussing them even like the politics and all the racial and the jq i enjoyed that like uh you know it's interesting to me and i enjoyed doing it i enjoyed those conversations and i think they were productive because i enjoyed it and i don't know if you you know you're just doing like you're basically the same thing you're just doing it because you enjoy it I'm here because I enjoy it and because of some like sort of vague sort of duty obligations and also because I feel like there's just so much honestly like I like the main reason why I'm starting YouTube like I'd be lying if I said it was any other reason besides the fact that I was simply uh just just distraught and dismayed at the amount of sheer falsehood being flung around on the internet and so me from my perspective back then I was like you know well it would be nice to sort of add my voice to the fray here maybe I could like change a few change a few people's minds because they're simply just not working with all the facts in terms of so many different things. So that's one of the reasons I started. And the other reason was, yeah, because it's something, it's something fun. It's something that I'm passionate about. And uh, I always, and I think that this is generally true for people who are sort of like, I guess, auditory learner focus is uh, my best, the best, my best sort of revelations and discoveries generally come from conversation with other people specifically people who are, you know, more learned or intelligent or have more life experience than I do. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's like, I'm like 40 now, and I, I would, about, you know, half of my adult life, I spend in full-time academics in, in the, you know, either yeshiva or university. And uh, the other half that I spent working, I rarely work more than part-time. And uh, I spent, you know, most of my free time, I always spent on intellectual endeavors. And uh, I've gotten to the point where, um, I feel I know quite a bit, like, I, cause I'm always learning from other people. And now like I'm watching like the news, I find I, very, I gain very little from that. And, uh, even like YouTube, when I was watching like, you know, the JQ and the debates on these subjects, like I know the stuff, like I've been studying, I know the stuff because I'm watching other people who know less about the subject, talk about the subject. And that's largely why I got on Luke Ford the first time was like in his chat and like, you know, so you got, you know, these big names and the alt writer, whatever, talking about the JQ and like they didn't really know what they're talking about so i got on the show um and uh that was really the precipice and then but th that wasn't really going anywhere so when i started to do duties of the heart i also i felt like I wanted to do something put the content out that wasn't out there already so i checked and like duties of the heart wasn't really out there so i put it out there and even the stuff on consciousness there's a lot of stuff on consciousness but it's a tough topic and uh, i watched like hundreds of hours of YouTube stuff on consciousness. I'm always watching the latest uh, researchers and their overviews of their different summits and uh, symposiums on consciousness. And, uh, you know, there's room, like, I, like, cause it, when you're doing your own research, 
and then you get to the point like i mean if you were in a master's or phd program that you know that's basically you you have to do unique research you have to have researched the field enough that you know all of the research in the area to know what you're contributing is unique and so i think i'm, I'm reaching that point in different areas where i've you know kind of read through you know waded through the research i've read through what's out there and i'm ready to possibly make my own unique scholarship in, in different areas including judaism or possibly other other areas of philosophy or at least i know you know where 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 the current state of research is and uh, you know judaism is a lot like that too today because i watch all the jewish programming and there's not really too much Jew jewish programming so unfortunate there's a lot of jewish stuff out there a lot of torah stuff a lot of commentary israeli news like the new israeli national law like i watched a few programs sholem tv and israeli tv and read the periodicals but there weren't really any good discussions on it it was kind of unfortunate And I don't know if you know there's like a gap to be filled. That I just want to be a talking head. So now, like people are, your Duvid is going to explain the new Israel national law, and like some random person in America, you know, who was interested in Israel, all of a sudden they, you know, Duvid is the one who's supplying this information. And I don't know if that's the role that I feel that I should be that 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 meant to, you know, to be to be played. Maybe you feel more of the interest in that role, or I don't really, yeah, I don't, you know, trying to dispel. Yeah, I'm not really a Hasbro type guy like his you know, like Mark Zuckerberg people uh, said about the Holocaust denial it's that you know people make mistakes there's reasons why people come to the wrong conclusions and it's tough to uh, you'll say do I have a role do I want to uh, try to dispel those wrong conclusions or I just want to put out my own stuff or, or really I'm just gonna end up like my dad who uh, spent his whole life reading and thinking about this stuff but never really did anything with it. Were you still there? So I think I might do this last PowerPoint and I had an article I was gonna read on Native Americans. Uh, belief in the soul. It's kind of interesting looking for looking for this stuff I found this woman from Russia who wrote this very good article on the concept of the soul among Native Americans, which you're probably taking like half an hour to read. And I got one more PowerPoint. So I'm not sure if you're still there, but I think I'm going to go into this last PowerPoint. Okay. So. I get this on indigenous sacred ways, understanding indigenous sacred ways, cultural diversity. Lame deer, Lakota nation, all animals have power because the great spirit dwells in all of them, even a tiny ant, a butterfly, a tree, a flower, a rock. The modern white man's way keeps that power from his, us, dilutes it to come up to nature, feel its power, let it help you. One needs time to impatience for that. You have so little time in contemplation. For contemplation, it lessens a person's life. All that grind, that hurrying and scurrying about. The Ukasa Wakan, holy man, wants to be by himself. He wants to be away from the crowd, from everyday matters. He likes to meditate, leaning against a tree or rock, feeling the earth move beneath him, feeling the weight of his big flaming sky above, upon him. Closing his eyes, he sees many things clearly, what you see with your eyes shut is what counts. There's a map of uh, indigenous groups discussed here in this PowerPoint. So merging ideas on indigenous religion. First, some tradition elders are beginning to share their core values regarding reverence for the earth with others because of their concerns about current ecological developments. Second, members of global religions are coming to new appreciations for profundity and value embedded in indigenous sacred ways, particularly with respect to the environment. Third, some members of global faiths are being attracted to the spirituality and practices of indigenous religions. However, some indigenous leaders fear that their spiritual traditions are being trivialized or exploited. Cultural diversity, although focuses on common characteristics of indigenous religions, 
these religions are quite distinct as a whole indigenous forms of spirituality exhibit traditions that develop within a spectrum of cultural, religious, and material diversity. Some indigenous cultures have been highly developed, whereas others still embody a basic strategy of survival. So groups whose material culture is simple, nonetheless may have highly complex cosmogenies or models of the origins of the universe and their purpose in it. Such groups may live in somewhat sheltered ancestral enclosures or large contemporary urban areas. They also varying degree of adaption to the absorption of the dominant religions in their regions. To the circle of right relationships for many indigenous peoples, everything in the cosmos is intimately interrelated, sometimes represented as a circle, which has no beginning, no end. Cosmos is thought to contain divinities, spirits, and ancestors. All aspects of the tangible world are imbued with spirit. Common things in indigenous life ways is developing an appropriate relationship with spiritual energy. So you have Navajo sand painting, shows Father Sky with constellations in the Milky Way, forming his body in Mother Earth with the four sacred plants, squash, beans, tobacco, and corn. So you have a spiritual specialist, hunting and gatherer tribes, religion is private. Individuals have direct access to the unseen. However, the world of the spirit is thought to be dangerous. Interacting with the spirit's world best left for those specially trained for it. You have storytellers common role because traditions are oral rather than written. What is held in memory cannot be physically destroyed, but if the, all the storytellers die, the knowledge is lost. African poets called technicians of the sacred. Other roles, drummers, tricksters, sacred clowns, secret societies, priests, priestesses, your mystical intermediaries. Shaman is a generic term used by scholars for those who offer themselves as mystical intermediaries. Shamanic methods are extremely ancient. Shaman is a, often a healer or a helper to society, maybe hereditary or recognized as a special gift. You have group observances, life, life cycle events, help maintain natural harmony of the world by practicing ritual observances, community centered, like birth, naming ceremonies, uh, coming of age, marriage, death. Individual observances balance the communal dimension of ritual observance. Important for individuals to experience a personal connection with the realm of the spirits, undergoing a vision quest. So contemporary issues, the near obliteration of these responses to the sacred world. Many indigenous people have been displaced by development. Indigenous worldview that reveres all creation, recognizes the circle of life, and honors the human relationship with Mother Earth may be necessary to stop the present ecological destruction of the planet. Animism, seen as the most primitive and defined as the belief in souls that derive from the first attempt to explain dreams in like phenomenon. Man and taboo, man is defined as a belief in inanimate and in, in imminent Supernatural domain or life force potentially subject to human manipulation. Polynesian and Malaysian concept of mana are contrasted. Malaysian mana is defined as a sacred and personal force that is much like the Western concept of luck. Polynesian mana is related to the concept of taboo, are related to the more hierarchical nature of Polynesian society. You have magic, your supernatural techniques intended to accomplish specific aims. It may be imitative or contagious. Anxiety. Control, solace, so magic is a form of control, but religion serves to provide stability when no control or understanding is possible. Rituals, formal, performed in sacred contexts. Rituals convey information about the culture of the participants, and hence the participants themselves, inherently social participation in them necessarily implies social commitment. It writes a passage uh, you know, which are religious rituals which mark or facilitate a person's movement from one social state to another. And usually they have three phases, separation, liminality, and incorporation. Separation, the participant withdraws from the group and begins moving from one place to another. Liminality, the period between states during which the participant has left one place but has not yet entered the next. And incorporation, the participant re-enters society with a new status, having completed the right. Liminality is a part of every right passage and involves the temporary suspension and even reversal of everyday social distinctions. 
Communitas refers to the collective liminality characterized by enhanced feelings of social solidarity and minimized distinctions. Totemism, rituals play an important right, role in creating and maintaining groups of solidarity. In totemic societies, each descent group has an animal, plant, or geographic feature with which they claim descent. Totems are the apical ancestors of clans. <coughs> each member of a clan did not kill or eat their totem except once a year when the members of the clan gather for ceremonies dedicated to the totem. Totemism is a religion in which elements of nature act as sacred templates for society by means of symbolic association. Totemism uses nature as a model for society. Each descent group has a totem which occupies a specific niche in nature. Social difference mirrored the natural order of the environment. The unity of human social order is enhanced by symbolic association with an imitation of the natural order. Religion and cultural ecology, like the sacred cattle in India, ahimsa, Hindu doctrine, nonviolence that forbids the killing of animals. Hindus seem to irrationally ignore the valuable food resource of beef. Hindus also raise straggly and thin cows, unlike the bitter cattle of the Europe and the U.S. These views are ethnocentric and wrong as cattle play an important adaptive role in an Indian ecosystem that has evolved over a thousand of years. Hindus use cattle for transportation, traction, and manure. Bigger cattle eat more, making them expensive to keep. They have social control. Power religion affects action. Religions can be used to mobilize large segments of society through systems of real and perceived rewards and punishment. Witch hunts play an important role in limiting social deviancy in addition to functioning as leveling mechanisms to reduce differences in wealth and status between members of society. Many religions have formal code of ethics that prohibit certain behaviors while promoting other kinds of behavior. Religions also maintain social control by stressing the fleeting nature of life. So various forms of religion. And religions vary culture to culture. There are correlations between political organizations, religious types, uh, religious practitioners, and type. Walls defined religions consisting of all societies, cult institutions, rituals, associated beliefs, and develop four categories from this. Shamanic religions, shamans are part time religious intermediaries who may act as curers. These religions are most characteristic of foragers. Communal religions have shamans, communal rituals multiple na nature gods, and are more characteristic of food producers and foragers. Olympian religions first appeared with states, have full-time religion specialists whose organizations may mimic the states, and have potent anthropomorphic gods who may exist as a pantheon. And monotheistic religions have all the attributes of Olympian religions, except that the pantheon of the gods is subsumed under a single eternal omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent being. Christian values, Max Weber linked the spread of capitalism to the values central to the Protestant faith, independent, entrepreneur, hardworking, future-oriented, and free-thinking. The emphasis Catholics placed on immediate happiness and security, and the notion that their salvation was attainable only when a priest mediated on one's behalf did not fit well with capitalism. So revitalization movements, religious movements that act as a medium for social change are called revitalization movements. Colonial era Iroquois reformation led by Handsome Lake example of revitalization movement. So what the hell are you doing, my child? Uh, syncretism is a cultural mix including religious blends that emerge when two or more cultural traditions come into contact, like voodoo. Syncretisms often emerge when traditional non-Western societies have regular contact with industrial societies. In syncretisms attempt to explain European domination and wealth and to achieve similar success magically by mimicking European behavior and symbols. So New Age since the 1960s, decline in formal organized religion. New Age religions have appropriated ideas, themes, and symbols in ways of life from religious practices of indigenous cultures. So re recognizing religion, difficult to distinguish between sacred and secular rituals, as behavior can simultaneously have sacred and secular aspects. Americans try to maintain a strict division between the sacred and the profane, but many other societies don't. It's like a pilgrimage. Consider like a pilgrimage. Do you want to learn about Malthusism? Myth, legends, and folk tales. Storytelling is common to every culture. Most people enjoy listening to stories. Storytellers have catered to the need of good stories since the beginning of civilization, most people have their own favorite story from childhood, and often these tales are both fascinating and frightening. 
including myth, legends, myths, and folktales. The legends is a semi-true story which has been passed from person to person. It has important meaning of symbolism for the culture in which it originates. A legend usually includes an element of truth or is based on historical fact, but with mythical qualities. Legends usually involve heroic characters or fantastic places and often encompass the spiritual beliefs of the culture in which they originate. Myths, story based on tradition or legend, which has a deep symbolic meaning. A myth conveys a truth to those who tell it and hear it rather than necessarily recording a true event. Although some myths can be accounts of actual events, they become transformed by symbolic meaning or shifted in time or place. Myths are often used to explain universal and local beginnings and involve supernatural beings. The great power of meaning of these stories to the culture in which they developed is a major reason why they survive as long as they do, sometimes thousands of years. Folk tales, popular stories that passed in on in spoken form from one generation to the next. Usually the author is unknown, and there are often many versions of the folk tale. Folk tales can Prize fables, fairy tales, old legends, and even urban legends. Again, some tales may have been based on partial truth that has been lost or hidden over time. It's difficult to categorize folktales precisely because they fit into many categories. Folktales are often referred to as tall tales. So what's the difference between legends, myth, and folktales? Myth, legends, and folktales are hard to classify and often overlap. Imagine a line or continuum, as illustrated below, with a historical count based on the facts at one end and myths or cultural folktales at the other as you progress towards the mythical folktale end of the line when an event symbolizes to people or what they feel about it becomes of greater historical significance than the facts, which become less important by the time you reach the far end of the spectrum. The story is taking a life of its own and the facts of the original event, if there ever was one, have almost become irrelevant is the message that is important. So why tell these stories? As well as making fascinating reading, these stories also tell us a great deal about how people in the past saw and understood the world around them. You know, strength and community provide common understanding. Stories often reflect the belief of people who tell them. Popularity of any story depends on whether those listening approve the values underlying it. By telling and listening to stories, people confirm their ideas about the world around them. Things that people found scary, infuriating, or desirable all found their way into stories and they were passed on because people wanted to be assured that other people around them were thinking along the same lines. So by providing moral guidance and showing people how they should conduct themselves, including the consequences of not doing so, myths and legend, like any good stories, often include a moral. Within the myth, the hurt or embarrassment experienced by people is often due to their own stupidity, greed, dishonesty, and negligence. To explain how the world works, for example, why the seasons change, and to explain strange happenings or phenomena such as eclipses, the reasons for which were unknown in early times or for entertainment purposes. Or to pass on history and knowledge, such as outcome of battles and tales of courage in ages when many people could not read or write, many myths had an early had an element of truth that has been built up and embellished over the years. Fame, money, recognition, all areas of life, not all stories were told for good reasons. Stories of bravery and battle could enhance the status of an individual or group in later centuries. A good ghost story could be sold for money. Truth was not always the most important consideration, regardless of why they were told. Many of the stories still remain popular today. Although we no longer swap stories around the fireside, the tradition of storytelling still continues in the form of urban legends. Many older stories still live on in current day carnivals or festivals, which have their roots in a very different past. So features of myths and legend, retelling, orientation is typically timeless, long, long, long ago. Simple, single animal is representative of all animals of that kind. Natural forces like wind and fire represented by gods or godlike form. The resolution of myths and legend explain why things the way are the way are. Classic opening or closing, once upon a time, and lived happily ever after. Representation of good and evil in characters, your stereotypes. Uh, representing certain values. Involvement of supernatural forces or based around themes like trickery and foolishness. You know, summarizing the outcome of the myth or legend, but still to this day, so every time you see, these comments sum up how things came to be. So what makes a hero? A hero is someone who is distinguished for his or her courage or ability. They are admired for brave deeds and noble qualities. They may have performed heroic acts. They may also be someone who is a model or an ideal. Tall tale is a story that provides enjoyment to a wide variety of audiences. 
Tall tales stretch the imagination through colorful, colorful figurative language and exaggeration. Tall tales are also known as lying tales. They're humorous exaggeration. Tall tales may come from other countries, but we are familiar with the ones of our own culture. So tall tales are often told about frontier days in the United States, exaggeration, the hardships. Could be about animals or weather, everyday events, ordinary people. But the most famous when tales are, you are about start heroes. Spreading your delusion. Oversized people, exaggerated deeds. And, uh, you know, Hinduism. A uh, quote from the Upanishad, in the beginning the, there was existence alone, o one only without a second. He, the one, thought to himself, let me be many, let me grow forth. Thus out of himself he projected the universe, and having projected out of himself the universe, he entered every being, and that it has itself in him alone. Of all things, he is that subtle essence, he is the truth, he is the self, and that, that art thou. Bhagavad there's no truth superior to me. Everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread. I am the taste of water, the light of the sun and the moon, the syllable, om, and Vedic mantras, the sound and ether and the ability in man. All states of being, goodness, passion, or ignorance are manifested by my energy. I am in one sense everything, but I am independent. I am not under the modes of this material nature. So nice timeline. So we've went over Hinduism quite quite a bit already. Very interesting. Five major doctrine. Truth is one. Sages call it by different names. All mankind is one family. The law of karma. Reap what you sow. The mode of living which is founded upon total harmlessness towards all creatures or upon a minimum of such harm is the highest morality. Whenever there is a decline in virtue, God incarnates himself on earth to uphold righteousness. So we went over this many times. Very interesting. Okay. So those are my PowerPoints. And... Uh, I think I'm going to finish. Is there someone here in the chat with me? Is there someone here with me? We are all here waiting for you to tell the goddamn truth. Okay. We get Jesse Lopez. You join me today. I am the leader of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. I am an upgrade of your religion. Okay. And that's what you wanted to say? I want to know when are you going to upgrade with me? Um, yeah, I don't really want to debate theology tonight, although I mean, we could discuss that at a different time. I wanted to cover the topic at hand. I was going to read this article on concepts of the soul among North American okay. Indians. Okay, thank you for your five minutes. Okay, take care. Thanks for joining. Okay, so I have... Uh, are you still there, Babs? Yeah, I bounced you because it was just showing me your picture. I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell if anyone was on. So, um, I think I'm going to read this last paper on uh, concept of the soul among North American Indians. And uh, you know, I don't mind anyone. I I, I want to get through what I'm doing. We could discuss things at a different time. And uh, you know, when I'm done, if people are still interested in talking, maybe, maybe we'll be able to talk. But uh, I found this pretty interesting, this article on uh, Concept of the Soul in North American Indians, actually written in Moscow. So interesting that this person was able to collect such a nice um, amount of data on this topic.
And so I think I'm going to read through this. Hopefully people find it interesting. If not, you know, if you see you want to come back in like 20, 30 minutes and talk, maybe we talk some more. Concept of soul among North American Indians. Eternity is neither the past nor the future. It is the dimension of human spirit, which is eternal. Just uh, make sure it's working. Okay. I'm going to read through this thing, I, this article. I just want to make sure my uh make sure it's working okay so the concept of soul among north american indians questions concerning soul have troubled mankind since time immemorial even before the beginnings of any religious teachings and belief they remain topical to present day with the development of sciences and technologies scientists plus pose more and more questions it is enough to remember their experiments about the determination of the weight of this non-material substance and of the time when it leaves the body after its death. But what is the soul? Where does it dwell? What is its predestination? Is it immortal? What way does it follow on earth and in the universe? Every society has tried to find answers to give a logical explanation for these and many other questions in accordance with the life experience and about ideas of the world. Thus, an entire conception was gradually built, which seamlessly integrates the cultural heritage of a particular people and which helps to better understand not only its worldview and culture, but also its soul. As a rule, the closest attention is paid to the processes happening to the soul after death. Though we will hardly be able to avoid this subject completely, we will attempt to track the particular peculiarities of its lifetime existence on the example of the concepts of soul among North American Indians as this aspect to our minds causes no less interest. The first and legitimate questions that arise when addressing such an issue are at the same time the most difficult ones. What is the soul? What is its essence? In most religions, it is immaterial, immortal element, the source of life in the physical body. Um, by E.B. Tyler's definition, and it seems brings us the closest to the understanding of the perception of this phenomenon by American Indians. Soul is a fine, immaterial human image, something like a stream, air, or shadow by its nature, it is the cause of life and thought and creatures it animates. Here we have an indication of some materiality of the soul, which is fully justified. It was difficult for primitive man to deal with abstract notions, to imagine them better, but it was necessary to clothe them in some kind of recognizable form, to associate them with the outer world. Such specification is observed for all peoples. It should be noted that American Indians have developed different ideas about the soul, for example, among the uh, Kligmit, uh, Obajwa, and Cheyenne, soul is the shadow of man. The Cheyenne believe that seeing one's shadow pat for presaged death, uh, the Tarahumara, and some California tribes think that is the breath, and the Hopi believes that is a liquid essence. And indeed, the dead do not move, so their shadow too freezes, practically disappears. Man is alive while his soul is in the body. When he stops breathing, he dies. These two views seem to be logical and are well explained by primitive notions. For the majority of lower societies, death comes at the moment when the tenant residing in the body and having some similar features with what we call soul leaves the body completely, even if physiological life has not faded away. This is one of the reasons for such hasty burial common among primitive people, but the version of the liquid essence is also explicable water for the Hopi who live in an arid region is the source of life in which everything depends on the rain. Their religion is riddled with uh, reverent attitudes towards the water. Probably that is why while the soul of the dead turn into uh, kachinas, the word kachi means life or spirit, their souls return to the earth pouring in blessed rain, Navala. Strange though it may seem, the question of the origin of the soul in American Indian mythology is almost never touched upon. Perhaps one of the few references is found in the Omaha creation myth, though it does not reveal the prime cause either. In the beginning of all things existed the mind of Wakanda. All creatures, including people, were spirits. They were flying in the intercellular space. They were looking for a place where they could be embodied in matter. However, the idea of souls or spirits of the dead is well developed throughout the whole continent. So by the mythological moment of establishing death, people already had to be spiritualized. But even those myths do not develop the subject. Perhaps such avoidance of mention of soul 
is connected with certain taboos as well as with the difficulty in understanding this phenomenon. Both among all other peoples and American Indians, we meet another notion, spirit, which is mostly used when talking about the dead or about helping spirits, despite the fact that is close to the notion of soul and is often inseparably connected with it. There are certain differences, although the Kiwawa Pachi, for example, use the same word to denote owl as a personification of the soul of the dead, spirit, and soul. According to some researchers, spirit may be of an independent origin as well as appear as a mythological creature. The notion of spirit is broader than the notion of soul. However, Tyler supposed that the difference between these terms was not too important for primitive man because they're based on the essential unity. As we shall see, these notions are often really similar, except when they are separate on purpose. To try to understand this controversial issue, we need also refer to the question of the number of souls in a man as the researchers of an American Indian religious uh, A. Who trans notes, in all of North America except the Southwest, the belief recurs in one form or another that man is equipped with two kinds of souls, one or more bodily souls that uh, grant life, movement, and consciousness to the body, and one dream or free soul identical to man himself as he is manifested outside of his bodies in various psychic twilight zones. When the body lies passive and immobile and sleep or unconsciousness, his latter soul sets out to visit faraway places. Even the land of the dead, the free soul of the ordinary individual, finds its way at random. The medicine man may intentionally direct his free soul there. And contrary to the layman, he generally may then return to the world of the living. Death comes when a man's free soul is definitely caught in the world of the dead. Then also the body soul, even conceived as breath, slips its moorings. This implies that the second free soul is more likely what we call spirit, for comparison, let us turn to the beliefs of the Pueblo Indians described more detail by White. Everyone has sats of an oak, literally the breath heart or soul, and sayotiene, uh, guardian spirit. He receives both at birth and uh, shipe from Iriko, the mother of all. So this guardian spirit looks after its ward during his life, protecting him from harm and keeping from evil. When a person dies, both the breath, heart, and guardian spirit leave his body and eventually return to his mother in Shippah. Pueblo Indians believe that the foremother gives soul to man, which corresponds to most popular opinion among all peoples about the supernatural origin of the soul. It is not accidental that the name of the supreme deity is translated as great spirit, who is invisible, pres invisibly present in all. Despite the uniformity of views among the majority of North American Indians on the presence of two souls in man, the Pueblo, Algonium, uh, Shushoin, Northern uh, Piute, the Tignet, and others, there are tribes who believe that there are four souls, like the Sioux, Yuktis, and Kando. The concept of soul cannot be studied in isolation from animism and totemism. American Indians believe that not only animals, birds, fish, and other fauna have a soul, but also plants. Tyler mentioned object souls in belief in which was especially strong among the Algon Algonium. In other words, the whole world around is animated, thus among the souks, the privilege to have four souls will not confirm to just man, but also extends to the bear, the most humane of the animals. No wonder that in myths, every animal and even insects represent a separate nation, because if all have souls, both humans and all living beings should be related in a certain way, and one quite seriously speaks about the dead and living animals as the dead and living people. Reasoning from this concept, it's easy to understand why animals become totems and protectors of American Indians. Even Frazier draws attention to the widespread belief in an external soul capable of not just temporarily leave the human body but hide an outside object or in the body of an animal for security purposes and derive totemism from this. It accounts for the present of hunting rights, which the hunter asks the killed animal for forgiveness and gives gifts to it as the souls of the animal responds to human actions, punishing people for pointless destruction of animals and thanking them for showing kindness to them. The idea of the external soul is reflected in such widespread phenomenon as the belief in a guardian and helping spirits who protect and guide the person. It can be the spirit of some animal or the soul of a deceased relative. If an average person as a rule has only one guardian spirit, medicine men can have several and more powerful ones, obviously. In this case, the connection between the soul and the spirit shell is absent. We're confronted with the recognition of the capability of the soul for independent existence and even various actions, more of a soul is endowed with a number of abilities and a certain power that is consistent with the idea present in many religions in fine material body. 
through which the soul acts in such a way that the physical body itself cannot. Such are probably the views with which the ideas about the wandering souls of the dead are connected, but we will return to this issue later. In the myths, various journeys of the soul are described in most detail. They can be of two kinds, unconscious when the person is in one of the broader states, which includes sleep and serious illness, and consciousness when the medicine man deliberately directs his soul somewhere or falls into a trance. Let's consider each of these kinds of journeys more closely. Uh, Kleeman gives a very good example of the relation of ideas about soul among primitive people in dreams. In dreams, the person moved to another place or saw how other people from his dream came to the place of his rest. After awakening, the people around him assured him that neither he himself nor his visitors had actually changed their location. He also saw the deceased alive, and out of all this, he allegedly concluded that man has a soul which can still in life leave the body and continue to exist after the death of man. It's a well-known popular belief that it is better not to wake up a sleeping person for his soul, which is set off on wanderings, may not have time to return to his body, which is very dangerous. However, here we go again confronting with dualism. So the Algonian suppose that one soul goes out and has dreams while the other one remains. A dream itself, according to the opinion of many American Indian tribes, is the visit of the sleeper's soul by the soul of the person or object which appears in the dream. Things seem in dream seen in dreams were treated rather seriously for these were messages from soul especially significant dreams just like visions received during illness were interpreted as often being a guide to action perceived as a warning instruction uh, or prophecy the iroquois believe that ignoring the secret desire of the soul can displease and anger it making it take away its energy which leads to the loss of soul and thus depression or illness moreover the loss of soul may kill sometimes of course the person's own wishes could be attributed to the demands of his soul. For example, there's an interesting belief in several tribes that the soul of the sleeping person leaves his body and searches for the objects which are attractive to it. These objects may must be acquired by the person when he wakes up so the soul will not grieve and worry and will not leave the body for good. In any case, his dreams were regarded as certain experiences full of information which the soul was trying to convey to the person and which would better not be ignored. In the case of serious illness, when the person was unconscious or delirious, the situation is similar to dreams. However, here another motive appears that the journey of soul between the worlds of the living and the dead, that is why people usually turn to medicine men for healing, the latter being the mediators between these worlds, capable of influencing the souls interacting with them in general. The role of the medicine man is very versatile, and no wonder that the most complex, subtle, supernatural, spiritual, and many other questions are solved by him, because as we have already mentioned, medicine men have their most powerful helping spirits. Uh, Elaide pointed out that shamanic ideology has deeply penetrated into specific areas of North American mythology and folklore, especially where it deals with afterlife and journeys to netherworld, with all the most sacred, but at the same time, the most dangerous. Though the shaman was not a healer in any physical sense, he gave neither medicine nor bodily treatment, but through the power of the spirits he controlled, he ex exercised and contended with those who caused sickness. It was considered that diseases were caused by evil spirits, thus the Dakota think that spirits punish people for bad behavior, especially for failing to observe the rights for the deceased. These spirits have the ability to send into a person's body the spirit of any creature or object, for example, the spirit of the beer, deer, turtle, fish, tree, stone, dead person. These spirits cause illness when entering the person. Healing usually goes one of two ways. Either the medicine man extracts or conjures away the foreign spirit, or in extreme cases, he has to set off for the soul of the sick person, which has already almost left the body, and return it back. Breath is often used in the treatment. The disease can be blown away or sucked out. We have mentioned above that one of the essence of soul is breath. Hence, we may conclude that it's not even the medicine man himself, but his soul that interacts with the soul of the patient and the spirits residing in him. Uh, the Tlingit, as well as many other tribes, believe, believe that as the medicine man has to start a journey in search of the soul of a seriously ill person, it can be caught and returned back to the body, resulting in the person's recovery or at least avoiding the threat of death. The Ojibwe even believe that a good medicine man can return the soul from the land of the dead right after the moment of death. Unlike the two previously described border states, sleep and illness, the journeys of the soul during trance can be both unconscious and conscious. Let us explain what we mean when the sick person himself resorts to the medicine man wanting to be healed. The latter can bring him back into trance during which the patient's soul unconsciously travels 
Well, medicine men can fall into the state intentionally. This helps him to liberate his own soul and to direct it to where he deems necessary. As we can see, medicine men communicate the most closely with the spirit world and all its manifestations. They also interact the most closely with the world of the dead. It's interesting that a number of tribes, Navajo and Apache, dread everything related to death and the deceased. And the reason for it is the belief in the existence of a soul after death in good and evil spirits. First of all, it was the fear of vengeance from the spirits that killed enemies, tortured captives, or even relatives who were dissatisfied, dissatisfied in some way with the descendants. As mentioned above, such spirits can send diseases and sometimes take the souls of living into the other worlds. However, in some cases, such fears worked as taboos. For example, among the Sioux, the fear of vengeance of spirits was the means that kept them from killing. Besides, hardly anyone wished to meet ghost spirits, which appeared in dreams, but also in daily life and took the forms of human beings, animals, and whirlwinds. The last, an idea spread all over Basin, over the basin. The outcome of such meetings could never be foreseen. The main reason why the Navajo are still horrified when meeting a ghost lies in the fact that the latter are a sign of near disaster, for instance, death of a close relative. The Navajo and Cheyenne believe that the approach of such a ghost is indicated by a whistle. But even with the observance of all the rites by the tribesmen in the absence of any offense at them, the dead do not leave the world of the living and constantly interact with it. The souls of the dead relatives may appear in dreams and warn from trouble, suggest what to do, report important information. The Algonian suppose that the souls of the dead are able to eat and drink. That is why they left food at the grave and the Iroquois left a hole in the grave or in the coffin so that the yearning soul could visit the body. However, the term soul is not quite appropriate here as we again deal with a minimum of two entities. Holcrantz underlines that wandering spirits are not the souls and the latter leave the world and go to the land of the dead. The motive of the journey to this country is well-developed in myths, which again makes us distinguish between these two notions, soul and spirit. Soul, according to the ideas of American Indians, is capable of transformations. This concerns not only the popular mythology hero of the tricksters who can change his appearance. In this case, we deal with bodily transformation, but the souls of medicine, men, and even animals, the Ojibwe believe that the appearance that the soul takes during its journey depends on its power. Moreover, it can even hide in various objects by itself or with the help of medicine men. For example, the Inuit medicine men, by means of spell, drove the soul of a sick baby into an amulet and hid it in its medicine bundle where it was kept in maximum security. Some American Indians also believe in reincarnation of souls, partially connected with the idea of the above-mentioned hunting rites, as well belief that the soul's ancestors may return to the tribe and the body of some of their descendants, which the tribesmen guess either by visions or by birthmarks. As Emmons notes, the Tlingit believe that the human soul can come to the world only in a human body, usually in the some same clan or family. With regard to animals and plants, their souls, as a rule, are reincarnated, reincarnated at the same place in the same area. Maybe that is why the majority of American Indian myths, the dead more often appear not as immaterial ghosts, but in quite a tangible form, which is practically identical to one they had that when they were alive. The idea about the land of the dead, or is called by the happy, hunt, happy hunting grounds, also speaks to the fact that the soul does not die with the body, a very poetic description of the afterlife given by Tyler, the shadow of the Algonian hunter hunts the souls of the beaver and the elk sliding on the soul of the snow on the soul of the skis. However, the problem of the existence of the soul after death is subject for a separate study. It is worthwhile mentioning that in the present research, we have not made an attempt to reveal all aspects that constitute the integral concept of soul among separate North American Indian tribes, but only the ones which seem to be most significant for our understanding of the inner world of those peoples and cultures, despite the fact that we can see some differences in the American Indian ideas about soul. However, there are much more similarities in them that it may seem at first glance for a number of above mentioned reasons the origin of the soul cannot be traced and remains rather vague substance is inherent not only in people but also animals insects plants and even objects which suggest that man is not the master of the universe but only part of it everybody has at least two or up to four souls which can move travel and reincarnate after death other physical bodies soul or spirit can exist independently and may take different appearances all these beliefs reflected in mythology, rituals, superstitions, and the traditions of the American Indians are still passed from generation to generation, being an integral part of their culture. Okay, so I'll put the link back in the chat. Those are all my presentations for today. So if someone wants to talk, 
we talk a little bit and uh otherwise I'm gonna call it a call it a night and I think I have probably two more presentations you know, one on linguistics and deconstructionism and uh one on uh religion oh so I, I kicked you you can't rejoin so I'm not sure are you gonna stream on your channel so if you if you stream on your channel maybe I'll join you my roommate's not home so you know I'll keep this uh relative to uh um yeah I didn't realize if you were there or not so like I couldn't tell if you were there so I just uh bounced you I'm not sure who Jesse Lopez is if he's serious wants to have a discussion or not um so I guess I'm going to end the stream appreciate everyone watching and uh you know you look look forward to about two more of these And then, uh, and then that's it. And then you'll see what uh, comes next. I'm not sure if I have anything else planned. Okay, so bye bye. If you want to stream Babs, you could uh, Twitter me or uh, hang out me or whatever. I'm gonna end it. Call it a night. Shalom. Namaste. Hare Krishna. Blessings. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs>